Good morning. Welcome to the November 12, 2019 public hearing for the meeting of the New York City Landmark Preservation Commission. I'll call the roll. Chair Carroll. Here. Commissioner Bland. Here. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Here. Commissioner Jacobs. Commissioner Chen. Here. Commissioner Devonshire. Here. Commissioner Goldman. Commissioner Gustafson. Here. Commissioner Everardo Jefferson. Here. Commissioner Lucky. Here. Commissioner Holford Smith. Okay. Okay, good morning, Commissioners. Uh, we're going to start today's preservation department agenda with public meeting items. A number of them were uh, read into the record at the last hearing, but not presented. Some of them are returning uh, for the second time. Uh, the first is item number one. This is LPC 20-02527, an application for a certificate of appropriateness of row Manhattan Block 673, Lot 1, 261 11th Avenue, aka 261 279 11th Avenue, 220-238 12th Avenue, 601-651 West 27th Street, and 600-654 West 28th Street in the West Chelsea Historic District. A complex of American Rambler style warehouse building designed by George B. Mallory and Otto and Beck and built in 1991. The application is to construct rooftop additions, replace windows, create and modify window openings, install storefront and built canopies, lighting, barrier free access ramps, car vents, and street tree pits, and establish a master plan to cover in the future installation of signage. This was last presented at the public hearing of October 29th, 2019. Uh, no action was taken at that time. And as a reminder, the applicants presented this proposal and testimony was taken, but uh, there was no response to testimony by the applicant just yet, and the commissioners did not discuss the proposal at that time. Good morning, Commissioner Sneehan, College Preservation Staff. Um, as Corey mentioned, this item is 261 11th Avenue, also known as the Terminal Warehouse Building. The overall project concept and the rooftop position was presented at the October 29th public hearing, and public testimony was heard. There is no discussion or action taken. Today, the applicant will review uh, the more detailed aspects of the additional scopes of work uh, that cover the window and storefront replacement, changes to masonry openings, flood vents, lighting, signage master plan, platforms and canopies, street trees, and bike racks, and we will then look to the commission for questions and discussion. I'll now turn it over to Rick Cook to present this additional information. Thank you. Can we have a motion to open this evening? Second. All in favor? Thank you, Commissioners. My name is uh, Rick Cook from Cookbox Architects, and uh, we're very grateful to be back here. It was only two weeks ago, but I remember it being really hot in this room and late at night, so now it's early in the morning and, and cold. Um, I, part of uh, presenting the public is trying to capture some sense of, uh, of emotional goodwill with the quality of the presentations that we're able to do. So if I, if I could ask you to please kind of channel being back there after the end of our whole presentation, I would really appreciate it. And the other thing that happened, um, we did have a chance to have uh, the supporting testimony read into the record. And I want to thank those who did uh, submit supporting testimony, including uh, Gail Brewer, uh, supporting testimony, Hudson River uh, Park Friend, supporting testimony, as well as the New York Building Congress, Redney, Abney, and then uh, the supporting resolution from New York's Landmarks Conservancy, which was read with some conditions that we intend to address in, uh, in our uh, presentation today, and also a unanimous vote of 35 0 support from Community Force 4, which also had conditions that we hope to address. So, thank you. And, uh, and I, I think. Um, uh, on the project, I mentioned emotions, but uh, part of what happens with a building like this is there is an emotional connection. You look at it, you smile, and you think about time and history. Uh, we had the uh, amazing blessing to work on a project this size where the owner speaks in a love language. He said, I love these timbers. I love this building. He, he fell in love with the building and his partners and purchased it. So that was, a, that was an interesting way to, to kind of start the project. So if you'll bear with me for a minute, um, we got through that whole presentation and then we didn't have a chance to go through some of the detail like the storefront and the signage and things like that. So if you could bear with me for a minute, I'm just gonna jump straight in to where we kind of were in that presentation and go right into the, into the storefront. Um, quick summary is that this historic district is fascinating in that about half the district exists in three buildings on the west side of 11th Avenue. Uh, it's really split. These big heroic warehouses, the three of them, represent about half the district. 
terminal warehouse itself is about 25% of the district. And across 11th Avenue to the east, it's a much finer grain. So this is the building that we had the opportunity to explore. I think all of us have gone by and thought about its history and what it was. I was fascinated to see that it really was done all at one time, and the changes have happened over, over time to the original structure. Um, we took the attitude that we wanted the building to be uh, a, a fairly conservative approach from 11th Avenue that the building would be restored. Um, one of the things is the first time in over 100 years that somebody's willing to invest the capital to bring it back and invest in the building for the next 100 years. So this is a, the wording of comprehensive solution. That is a, a balanced proposal about how you take this building and invest the capital to restore the entire building and come up with a future for this building for the next 100 years. Uh, one of the things that I talked about is sometimes I just see a parking lot and a historic district and really want to do a building that would repair the street face. Sometimes there's a building that I think should go away, like the, the building over St. Uh, St. John's building over, over West Houston, which just came down recently, not near the district, but we're doing the Google headquarters from South. And this one is just a storefront that I thought was so possibly insensitive to the, to the history of the building that we just really wanted to, to fix it. So this is what's there now with this kind of insensitive uh, storefront pushed out uh, close to the, to the glass. This is uh, what we're proposing, and because the trains came in at an angle, if you remember the historic picture came in at an angle, it's actually got, a, got an angle to the way it bends in off of 11 and into the tunnel. So if I take this and just go to the obligatory plan and, and elevation, what we wanted to do was expose that first, that first four feet. Of, uh, of masonry march, and then make a connector back. The grain of the building runs north-south, so rather than put the storefront perpendicular to that angle of the tunnel, uh, there's the way, if you look at the details, the way to install it is perpendicular to that grain. So we wanted to install just a very sensitive top glass storefront. I think it might be the first time ever we proposed uh, revolvers, and that was one of those issues. If we put a vested building in, we would have this big box inside of the arch if we did one of our magic boxes like we like to do to hide the, the revolvers. In this particular case, we wanted just the lightest touch of the revolvers to provide an environmental break uh, in the inside and make it as light as possible so the tunnel continues to be the hero. If we come around on, on the side, the building uh, en enters at about 10 feet up here and exits about six foot elevation. The building was a loading dock building. It was a machine for bringing trains in, loading and unloading. So in general, like many of these buildings, we need to, we need to make that transition from sidewalk level up to what was loading dock level. So uh, we want to provide accessibility and easy access. Uh, so this is kind of a typical condition. I'll look at a couple of those. Uh, every single storefront in the whole building is in something we call Appendix B, the giant book that uh, is also uh, submitted as part of our application. Uh, the building has a history of painted signs and castle we'll talk quickly about the signage master plan. Uh, we wanted a kind of light industrial touch for how we get up. Uh, you can see here, this is the accessible ramp up to an entry. The typical storefront is back one foot, but at places where we have door swings, it's actually even a deeper recess. And we have these incredibly deep masonry openings that allow us to read the masonry on the return. So that made it a, a nice way that we were able to install the storefronts. Also, we wanted to kind of speak the language of the original powerful arch or opening that's there with the new storefront insertion. So you see here is just a, a, a kind of typical uh, storefront with a kind of uh, uh, blade, vertical volume by Shuko with a custom fin on the front just to create a shadow line to hide that caulk joint in the back and just get a nice, fine shadow line and then a plane of glass. So this is. This represents uh, a typical storefront condition for the many, many storefronts that happen on the building. As we move down the side street, the beautiful cobblestone street between Stair and Lehigh and uh, and building, also we're really happy to get a uh, letter of support from the owners of the Stair and Lehigh building. Art, sorry, I didn't mention that, but that was important to us how these two buildings uh, exist next to each other. Um, this is mid-block, uh, where you can also enter the building, and you're just seeing a little bit of the daylight that's coming down from the courtyard that we proposed as part of the area transfer. 
Um, this, this arch is one of the original arch openings in 1891. The storefronts were a series of these arches. Uh, the vast majority have been modified. So our attitude about the storefronts was to keep the MOs, the jam location and the head location, as they are now, including if there was an arch and leave that, and only modify the sill conditions as we go around. That was the strategy for the whole project, with one exception, which is to get the quality of trucks off the street. And I'll talk about that in one minute. So this is quite similar. I'll, I'll go past this um, and come all the way around to 12th Avenue. On 12th Avenue, the attitude about the tunnel is very similar. We've chosen to recess it just a little bit deeper on 12th Avenue. Um, and you can see that here. Uh, again, 12th Avenue is not the same angle as 11th Avenue, so the grain of the tunnel is very specific north-south, so we installed the storefront on that north-south axis. But the plane of 12th Avenue is slightly different, and that's why you see the two different here. You can see that uh, the entire tunnel starts at about 10, ends at about 6, and then the stores have multiple levels around, around the perimeter. Um, as we come around the side, uh, this is where the most significant intervention at the base is, where we're trying to get the, all these trucks off the street, all these luggage trucks off the street. Can I ask a question? Of course. Your drawings show a 12-inch recess for the glass. Renderings don't do that. The, the shadow elevations? It just looks like it's very shallow on know. one side and very deep on the other. Yeah, I, I, uh, I apologize. Which is uh, uh, the intention? The, the renderings are accurate, and the shadowing on the elevations is not accurate. I just noticed that last night. So it's like the plan dimensions are the same depth, and the windows above and below are the same. Actually, they changed. What's happening right here on store 26, it, it actually collapsed and was rebuilt. It is the one opening that has uh, the one set of openings that are much shallower uh, on store 26. So if I go back, uh, thank you for your question. I, this, this is a typical here, where you see the depth, the double return depth, and there's a long bar for the uh, drum blank on the name for how you hang the shutters. And you can see here the relative depth. So on the left hand side, it's, it's measured as one foot. The typical depth of the windows is about is one foot. And the storefront is deeper in these, in these conditions to deal with the, uh, with the door swings. In the straight on elevations, uh, we were able to get the shadow line accurately shown. So the shadow lines are more diagrammatic and not, uh, not dimensionally accurate. Okay, thank you. Um, so again, store 26 has a much shallower opening, just one of those funny things that you don't notice at first, but when you peel back the layers, you wonder why it is, and you found out that store 26 collapsed and was rebuilt. Um, coming down the side street, the other thing, um, we have a series of flood vents protect the building in, uh, in a flood event. We're actually equalizing the pressure in most of the locations. So we need to allow water in and equalize the pressure on the slab so it doesn't buckle the foundation walls on the slab. Um, in a couple of locations, we've actually done dry flood proof, which had drop-in barriers and, uh, and hydrostatic pressure uh, resistant construction in those a couple of uh, uh, locations. But what we've done is hide the uh, the flood vent behind a perforated screen in a typical condition like this. So the flood vent is here and the screen goes out the face so you don't see it. It's a, it's a pre-made detail. It comes pre-packaged with insulation in it to allow the, the pressure through. We didn't want to expose that. Um, and where we could, we hid them behind the elevated platform. So here you can see the existing condition where there was a platform. Uh, and, and a, uh, a window and the fire escapes up above which are going away and this is that same opening with the elevated platform and the marquee above and that flood vent hidden behind the platform. Um, the next one was the building is really known as, uh, as a building that's got trucks all over the sidewalks. It's very hard to come down 22nd and 28th Street. The trucks are all over the place. We have a sidewalk bridge out. And uh, this is the typical condition of uh, trucks just come right across the sidewalk. Very poor pedestrian experience. And all of these red marks are those kind of loading docks where, where trucks are coming up right now. So the solution to that is to create off-street loading bursts. Um, and so we created five off-street loading bursts between block A and block B to 
to get the trucks off the street and restore the streetscape. So in what you're seeing here in the, uh, in the pinkish color are the new platforms that allow people to come and go. And the gray that you see over by Block A and Block B, that's five off street loading birds directly to service elevators to get those trucks off the street and open up the sidewalk again to the public. Um, in context, it's in this blue box right here. We'll blow that up in a minute. So uh, five off-street loading bursts is a lot. Uh, in the context of the 670-foot-long elevation is why I showed this elevation. Uh, this is the existing elevation, and the red dashed lines are the openings that existed originally. So it's already been heavily modified over time. And what we need to do is open that up to get these uh, five off-street loading bursts found at this location. The idea being that in a comprehensive solution for the entire building, this is an excellent place to get the street uh, trucks on and off, uh, off the street and into loading burrs with the doors back down and not have the entire streetscape uh, blocked by the trucks. Um, also, in, a, in an industrial neighborhood, it's always tricky, the concept of street trees. So what we're showing the green dots are actually uh, street trees that are proposed, five of which exist right now. Um, our, our thought about this is that it's a building that's connecting from 11th to 12th Avenue, really kind of connecting the city over to the Hudson River Park. And I think in this one location, I think the street trees are nice and, uh, and the light shadow on the street. Would, uh, would make sense, and there already are street trees here. It's not like it's embedded in Soho or Tribeca. It's already an edge condition that already has street trees. So we're proposing those and the other street furniture, so street trees in front of the, um, in front of the building, and, and uh, bike racks were believers in the importance of uh, bicycle commutation, and so we want to do that as well as having uh, a great bike entry and bike storage on the street. So that is, uh, that's getting through the storefront, kind of finishing our last, uh, our last presentation, the second part of the presentation. And Cass uh, will, will mess that over and we'll talk about some of the other elements, including the uh, signage on the windows. Thanks for Cass back for breaking this great part of the program. Good morning, commissioners. Um, as you see in, uh, in our renderings, we are proposing signage uh, in a few different uh, locations. There's an existing signage master plan for the building. This uh, includes many of the same components with a couple different additions. And as you've seen in these renderings, this one in particular, there's sort of two different registers that we're proposing signage for. One is this sort of proper register, um, narrow blade signs that would be visible from a block or so away just on the north and south elevations. And then signage at the base of the building that paint the wall signs and plants. Uh, of that nature. So um, included in this, included in the packets that you have, are uh, proposed elevations that represent the overall master plan concept. So above is the 28th Street elevation, the north elevation, the 27th Street elevation on the bottom. Again, sort of two registers. So in these, what we've indicated is a zone here where there could be up to four uh, blade signs. Um, these are located above the marble bottom tree at the midpoint of these elevations. So uh, on the north elevation and on the south elevation. And then in addition, um, up to three blade signs that would mark the primary entries for the office tenants in the, uh, in the floor as well. In addition to that, at the, at the sort of pedestrian scale, is a combination of, of uh, painted wall signs, plaques, decals, and then signage on uh, select canopies. And that is similar to what uh, is currently proposed under the, uh, under the current master plan. Just to call out, the only illuminated or face illuminated signage would be here, uh, here and on the other side of 28th Street uh, at the entry to the market holes. Uh, these signs would be uh, lit with external, very small fixtures, and the blade signs would not be, uh, would not be, would not be The north, uh, sorry, the east and west elevations, uh, so 11th on the left, 12th Avenue on the right. Uh, again, uh, primarily signage at the base, uh, building signage here uh, at, the, at the main entries, and then of course retaining the historic signage that exists in the building. On 12th Avenue, where there's a marquee, we're proposing uh, just dimensional letters on that marquee, similar to the North and South elevations. As I said, uh, historically, the building had a range of sign types, particularly uh, dimensional letters calling out the individual stores, as well as uh, on the east and west elevations. Um, this, this historically said central stores, it currently says terminal stores, and other signage across the, uh, the two facades. 
The building also had a prominent flagpole um, on the 11th Avenue elevation, but the cast iron and water towns remain. Uh, we're proposing to uh, re restore the flagpole uh, with building signage uh, as seen in the, uh, in the rendering on the far right. Um, looking at the different component parts of the, of the master plan, so again, uh, painted wall signs uh, could be installed on these brick piers, similar to the wall signs that are uh, currently in place in the building uh, that have been approved and are installed under the current master plan. We're also uh, allowing for either plaque or dimensional letters in a two foot by three foot um, square on, uh, on the piers as well. Uh, and then finally, decal signage consistent with the staff rules that allow for no more than 20% area of, of the glass on which the signage is installed. So those three pieces are, are together. And then um, at the marquee, so uh, face lit, like a neon light sign at the mid blocks where the market hall is, similar to the signage at the Chelsea Market, that's shown in section uh, here. Uh, and then just dimensional letters here uh, on the balance of the marquee is also 24 inches uh, in height, seen in section uh, in this detail here. So two, two different treatments uh, depending on the location of the base. Uh, and then finally, uh, the blade signs on the upper register, these would project no more than 18 inches off the, uh, the face of the building from the property line. Uh, they'd be two-sided, two uh, and again, they call out the entries to the market hall, the main, um, the main building entries uh, for the tenants, and are limited to just the north and south sides uh, of the building. Um, turning to the windows, we wanted to address some of the testimony and also talk a little bit more in detail uh, about our proposal. Um, we believe our approach as a sort of holistic one, all at one shot uh, proposal is quite different than what's been approved in the past. And currently, there's also a window master plan that allows for up to seven different window types around the base of the building. Um, that's quite different than our approach, which is looking um, toward uniformity following the, the historic uh, condition of a single type around the whole, uh, the whole building. Uh, we also want to sort of point out, particularly this view, which you've now seen a number of times, this is sort of primary view of the building is this um, solid to void ratio with warehouse buildings typically the windows are, are secondary to the masonry and in particular on the 11th and 12th avenue sides of that is the case. Also the depth of the windows in the openings, what's interesting looking at this photo perhaps from some distance, it's hard to pick out actually the configuration of the windows and actually on this elevation there are um, four uh, multi-light windows that remain but they're harder to see because of the depth, um, we think the depth of the openings and the amount of masonry relative, uh, relative to, to the window openings. Um, turning to the public testimony, so um, as Rick said, we had supporting testimony. The Conservancy actually um, uh, was, was supportive of, of, the, of the project, and in particular the windows. Um, and uh, on the other side, the community board, um, we got into a very long conversation with the community board at their um, land use sort of committee. And what was interesting is that they were um, sort of focused on this idea of uh, multiple types of windows. Um, they thought that the different treatments on different parts of the building uh, was appropriate. They thought a conservative approach on the east and a more relaxed or forward looking approach on the west um, was acceptable. They also said they were quote unquote concerned about overly unifying the window types. For us, we're actually not afraid of that. We're actually promoting a, a uniform window type. Um, and in large part, we think that a sort of multiple, um, multiple configurations on these elevations actually creates a sort of confused portion of the building. Um, and one might actually walk by the building and think that it was built in phases at different times. And so having a single treatment for all of the windows, we think is actually a more appropriate, uh, more appropriate approach. Um, our proposed rendering, which you've seen, restoring the shutters, bringing back some texture uh, and depth uh, through, through that across, uh, across all four elevations. Um, turning to the existing elevations, there are uh, remaining about um, a, a range of about uh, on each elevation. This is the north elevation, 25 uh, multi-light windows sort of scattered across the west 28th Street elevation. Those are called out uh, both for this stone and this stone, both for the arch and segmental windows. On, on the south elevation, on 27th Street, um, slightly more 39, those are uh, located along the uh, shaftways, particularly where the, the elevators were or continue to be. Uh, and then the east and west elevations, so the four on 11th Avenue and one on 12th Avenue. Most of the windows have been replaced, and most have been replaced with one of the one windows currently. Uh, looking at some existing conditions on 28th Street, again, you can see some of the multi light windows, six over six, and then some of these 15 over 15 in the shaft way, as well as uh, 
earlier one-on-one windows, and then these two here, these are actually two one-on-one windows that were approved under the current master plan. So the master plan actually contemplates removing all of the windows uh, in this location, multi-light windows, and installing one-on-one windows. That's what the current uh, proposal allows for. Uh, detailed photos of some of the replacements and then the, some of the remaining shutters that actually exist uh, at the second floor. You can see how they tuck in uh, in this uh, recessed uh, grid detail at the, at the head of the jams. Um, the depth of the windows can be seen in this image. Um, so non-historic, uh, obviously, uh, one over one windows, and a replacement six over six. It's just going to be uh, an interesting treatment here. You can see tin, tin to fill uh, to fill more tendency that that uh, uh, And then a few other images. This is on the on the 27th Street side. So um, two six over six windows that were replaced um, under the master plan as well as uh, louvers and one over one. This is a, a series of elevations from the current master plan. So we have the two end elevations on, uh, on the left of the slide, uh, 27 from the top and 28 on the, on the right, uh, on the bottom, sorry. I'm not sure if you can see this, but you can see the number of one over one windows that are allowed uh, in the mid-block area uh, as part of the master plan lights on the east and west ends. And what we've done is we've just provided a few um, large elevations, again, to show that multi-lights uh, under the master plan were at the uh, at east and west ends of the building, stores one and two, uh, and 25 and 26, but with a number of one over one windows in the mid-block zone. So carrying all the way across to store 10, six over six at store 12, and 14, different configuration of block B where those buildings have been enlarged, back to, to one over one windows, at 22 and 24, and then multi-light uh, on the far west end of the building. Um, again, our challenge here is that we've been building with relatively low floor floor heights, um, and it's, as a full block building, it's quite deep, um, and that presents a challenge as well. The building by itself, um, typically fewer window openings relative to the base of the warehouse building. So we're looking, as, as, as Rick said a couple weeks ago, we're looking to harvest as much light into the interiors uh, as we can. Um, our proposed elevation is the elevation and showing the shutters uh, on each of the windows where they were historically, the different treatments for the different window types. So uh, the arch, uh, full arch, segmental arch, and then the paired openings here uh, in block B with the, uh, with the shutters where they existed uh, historically. The 27th Street elevation and then the uh, east and west ends are allowed uh, as well. That is noting the relationship with solid and void. We think it's quite significant. Uh, and then finally, um, the 1890s King's handbook photograph, an existing photo in our proposed rendering. I think what's interesting, particularly about the historic photo, is the presence of the shutters, but also in this American Round Arch style building where you read the arch. You don't really read the infill. And going back to, to this photo, where you really, you know, the, the multi lights are here, 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 and here, but from a distance, you really don't see them much differently than even the single light window. So we think. Given the depth, the shadows that are, that are um, on the actual openings from those deeply recessed uh, windows, and then the presence of the texture that will be uh, restored back to the side of the shutters, we think that this holistic approach to a single light window um, for this project at this time uh, is appropriate. Uh, we were also asked to speak about the lighting. I think the West Side Highway uh, has a certain <coughs> Quality to it, the stairs high it looks beautiful at night. So um, if we have uh, thought about how to light the building at night as an integral part of the design of the building, uh, these overall plans talk about how we're planning to do that. We have a small recessed light fixture at the base of each one of the arch windows to try to light up the arches. There's a little bit more lighting at the canopies and at the handrail going up. Uh, going up to the platforms and then to light the signage uh, around the arch and a little bit in the landscape of, uh, of the relocated area and composition at the top. Uh, there's a little bit more lighting at the entry into the courtyard. Uh, we wanted to light the heavy mass of the building and emphasize the, the, the masonry mass. So light fixtures have all been chosen to be as small and dull black as possible with the intent that they can all go away, tucked into some form of architecture. The uh, one on the left is tucked into that recess. Uh, this one is quite small on the facade. The up light and around the arch is mounted all the way at the sill of the window, which should not be seen from the street. It's a, a linear LED. Um, 
there is uh, another little spot that comes out of a small neck to so spread onto the masonry. And then the one right here is actually designed to come out on pins and be bent um, onto the arch to like the, the graphics. Uh, we get to know that beautiful on the street next to uh, the stair of the pie that's always been there. And there's something about this sense of place on the west side where we think that lighting of the building is appropriate. Um, with a little bit of time that's left, I, I wanted to go back about the strategy of why did we do what we did. Um, there's a love language around the timber. Somebody brought in Dr. Cook, and then the chronologist, and gave the timber to 1512. Um, the C and the D block have the primary amount of this timber. Um, the building had changed over time. Store 3 and Block B and Store 26 were rebuilt with fireproof construction. And the building was intended to go to Block A, the fireproof construction, and built over it. Um, the real trick is if we were to take 12% of the area and spread it around on the building, we could nip and tuck it away and it would be uh, it, it would be one way to do the project. In fact, we started that way. Because of the close around combustible construction, it would have meant that we would have lost all the timber construction. So we made the decision to save the timber construction in this kind of larger one-year uh, process of trying to decide what's the best thing for this building long term, to save the timber in C and D, reconstruct A, fireproof construction, and then take that area, that 12% of the area, and find a home for it that we believe is appropriate to the west. And part of that is driven by the plan for the building originally. Um, so this is the diagram that shows where the area is. The areaway that's cut out to bring daylight in for human occupation. And this is the longest view. So we're in an elevated position, three blocks outside of the historic district. But I think it's the one that you know tells the story the most. It's really kind of an elevation that you really get to see in real life. The building um, is goes all the way from here, past the trees, all the way to Eleventh Avenue. And for us, it was important to have the historic profile, the original and the raise, that profile be clearly legible and the penthouse to be in contrast and balanced and, and we think an elegant composition relative to hysterically high. So the important thing here is um, there was some comment about changing materials and more masonry. I think it's really important to keep the legibility of the original profile and that's, that was the reason for that. And again, this view is three blocks outside the district and from an elevated position on the highway. Um, the other context is we wanted to design something that would be unique and appropriate for this one spot, not appropriate any place else. <clears throat> Thus, this commission uh, in 2019 approved something that was deemed appropriate one block away, which is in geographic context similar. But our project, I think, is much closer in spirit to the Domino uh, warehouse project. They're both machines. They both weren't really buildings in the conventional sense. Ours is a railroad infrastructure project. This is the crazy sugar melting thing. It's such an amazing building. And twice, this submission approved a clearly visible addition on top of it. This is the second one. And the view from the, uh, from the low scale Williamsburg shows the context in that the uh, architects used the proportion of the underlying round American round arch architecture to generate the form. And in that way, we are quite similar. We have a very regular pattern and rhythm on the building that's related directly to the freight cars, which we talked about two weeks ago. And there's this wonderful history about the High Line being splitting the, the city into multiple levels. So there's this idea about the city growing and adapting on multiple levels. And this idea of this double-decker train and the heavy masonry contrasted with the infrastructure. Um, and that brought us to this architecture up above. So what you see here is the proportion of a rail car. Uh, where, where the uh, Century Green, which is one of the New York Central Railroad uh, boxcar colors, the, uh, the freight car red of the, of the frame, and that all together is a composition relative to the historic uh, outline of the building. And we always view this project in context with the Sterrick Lehigh. It's always below the Sterrick Lehigh. It's always deferential to the Sterrick Lehigh. And those house types you see in the distance are the Sterrick Lehigh's house types. Uh, this is another uh, 
view very far outside the district and also from an elevated position that I think does tell a story about the legibility of the historic profile versus the addition and the composition with the stereotypes high. Having the stereotypes high read all the way down and almost the, the, uh, the turbo warehouse being the foothill for that composition. And then what I think is really important about how this whole holistic scheme comes together is that when you're standing in the historic district, we get the restoration of this building, all done at one time, uh, with these three buildings all sitting together in a, in a very comfortable context. There's some things that we didn't talk about. The, uh, the chimney was, was, was something we haven't really talked about, but it's kind of lopped off and stunted right now, and it's got this celebratory quality to it. And so getting the restoration of that, getting the shutters back on it, and getting the depth of the tunnel, retaining this wonderful history of the timbers, and finding an appropriate home uh, for the relocated area. Thank you very much for the chance to uh, finish the presentation. One question. Yes. Um, Square feet that are in the building now is the same as the square feet that are in the building. It's identical. Uh, it, one to one. It's a one to one. Uh, our composition is exactly the same amount of square footage that's there now. Every square foot that was changed is, is found on the home that we believe to be appropriate. So, exactly that much. Thank you for the question. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Is there an elevation that shows exactly on the sides of the buildings? how the signage is going to look. Yeah. Um, so I'll go to, I'll go to the overall elevation in a minute. Um, there's painted signage at the bottom. They're proposing two lane signs that you can see in this view. And if you, if you bear with me, I will go back. You can see the blade signs here in the long view.
So you're anticipating retail of the other floors? No, uh, commercial. Oh, commercial. commercial. So let's say, you know, people who are supposed to take some space and build it. They're going to move it out and build it. Potentially. Okay. So, and then on the, on the retail, you know, the retail street level, do you have a sense, is there a sense of how many retail spaces there could be and what, how many signs there could potentially be? Uh, let's check the elevation first and we'll go back so to the floor plan. Sure. So, so, the tendency is not, no, no. So, what we're showing here is that these sort of brighter yellow zones are the sort of primary locations for signage. The other ones are sort of allowable other locations, but we see these as the sort of main sign areas for the individual base. But I think we don't right now, we don't know right now how many tenants there would be. There could be single day tenants, there could be somebody who took five days. I think it's just not sort of known for sure. If we go back to the ground floor, I think it's not going to be a little bit of discussion. Yeah. 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 This is sort of, so this is. This is the central area um, where the where the worker signs would be, sort of the market um, hall inside. Uh, and then this is just a you know a, a set of plans by store, but it isn't necessarily how the spaces would be. It's, it is defined sort of each uh, zone by store as as the building has been got the store. But there could be you know, there could be a single tenant who's taking you know a lot of space, a lot of space or a little space. Yeah. So if you're tenant, okay. So mm -hmm. uh, just so we understand, I understand the part of the side. So if you're tenant taking a lot of space, then you get a blade, one blade. So what do you get? So no, there are blades on it. You you could get signage on the piers between okay. your uh, between your you know across your store. Okay. Uh, and then depending on where you're located, not every day has a canopy. So you would potentially get a sign on the canopy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you're just a, a smaller tenant, it's... Right. So it's just something on the glass on or something the glass. On, on the adjacent okay. pier. So. Okay. 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 And then... Uh, I have sorry. a couple of questions on image and that. <coughs> Uh, how do you explain the image of the building? Uh, the composition of a base and a glass piece. Uh, how do you, what's the image you're looking for? Or you think? Uh, the, uh, the, the idea behind the composition is that we would have the legibility of the original terminal warehouse, this long, low building, but you know, we, we call it a ground scraper instead of a skyscraper. So we're thinking of it as kind of a workplace of the future. And you have a very clear, legible, dense masonry base. And then clear legibility of that profile. And then at, uh, the area that's relocated being expressed with the DNA of this one building. So that was the time that was spent talking about the box car proportions and that this is an expression that would only happen in this building. The only way we could offer something like this is in this project, uh, unique. And that uh, that should speak clearly legible as a later addition. The building was built in 1891, then was adapted with uh, non combustible construction that was two stories taller, that's clearly there. The storefronts were changed. It's a building that has adapted and changed. It's been big enough and powerful enough to adapt and change over time. And we view conceptually this uh, relocated area and its architectural expression as the next level of adaptation and adaptive reuse over time, getting it ready for the next hundred years. That is supported by the idea that we found the rendering of the building that had been uh, proposed for the, the next addition to the to the west. But the glass, the glass portion. Yes. The roofer. Yeah. And you have, I think you have an exoskeleton. Right. And then you have boxes on top yes. of that. Yes. And then you leave, you have a set of yeah, the existing, the existing roof and the new exoskeleton, right? 
So the question, my question simply is, what kind of image would you be looking for? When I see that, I'm saying, it is a, a ship, is it? That's the image you're in. Yeah. Like a 1960s thing. Go back to those. Uh, see those. Attached to the face. But I, I don't see an image. What's the image? Just give me the yeah. idea. Well, you said the boxcars. Yeah, the, the boxcars are absolutely part of the uh, aesthetic inspiration for the building, both in the proportion, especially the proportion of the building. Proportions of the entire building are established by boxcar dimensions, all the way down the whole length of the building. The stores, even though it was all built at one time, the stores are this boxcar proportion. In fact, the center sidebar was on access to the original elevators. So we thought that that in the kind of DNA of the building, that was a proportional thing that we could work from, a kind of solid footing to start thinking about how to express the building. Oh, go back one, go back one, back one. And then there was this idea about the context of what, what it looked like when we had the West Side Cowboys and we had rails cutting across the east and west and we had carts and, and vehicle, motorized vehicles going north and south and the city on the far west side, this hard working far west side was just too busy and we split the city into multiple levels So we built the high line and we built the elevated highway and this was all envisioned at one time, this view of the city of the future, that it could exist on multiple levels. Then we found this image here that we thought was kind of interesting, this double-decker uh, train car with proportions and the contrast of the heavy masonry buildings with the light metal frame and the kind of box cars. And so these two images together were also a form of inspiration for us when we face maybe not a blank canvas, but a canvas that's loaded with DNA to, to work from, a palette of materials that we think could compose an elegant composition. And then, so this proportion that we look at right here is the proportion of a boxcar, a very specifically portion of a boxcar. And then to layer in the next level, the, the exoskeleton, as you called it, is freight car red. So it recalls this kind of hard working quality of the far west side. And to accentuate that proportion of the glassware element is the frame that's shown in the, in the century green that shows the proportions of the boxcar. So I'm sorry? You're using a railroad map. Yes. In this Absolutely. Yeah, I think we, we spoke at length two weeks ago about just why that narrative for this building was so important. This building was built around a rail uh, rail track, and it was this sort of dynamic piece of rail infrastructure. So yes, that's, that's, that's at the heart of this. And the tunnel, that, that tunnel has always been the lifeblood. So this thing that allowed this building to exist as an experience and survive these multiple generations was built literally on the rail tracks. It's shaped because of the rail history. So we wanted our proposal to be shaped by the rail history. Any other questions? I have another question. Just, just as far as understanding the building and what Approximately. Yeah, 130,000 for total for the ground floor. Right. 80,000. Uh, 
about 70,000 total for retail. So the rest is the funnel. If you're going to you have to get a I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just actually trying to get a sense of what will the office be able to do. Because you have a lot of If we go back to the ground floor plan, mm -hmm. here, um, and I can uh, walk there. Uh, Big picture. It's a big, it's a big yeah. project. <laughs> it, it's a big, big picture. It's over a million square feet, and it's really viewed as workplace of the future. We'll yeah. say the anti Hudson Yards. Um, so it's it's a million square foot building on workplace on its side, um, mm -hmm. and it's 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 really designed to be relief from from something like a tall glass skyscraper. It, the workplace of the future. Uh, we found the, that they seek authenticity. And if I had a really good definition for that, I would definitely use it. But there's something about connecting the place in buildings that were formerly useful. So right now, in a, in a strange, in a strange shift, uh, the, the <coughs> corporations that want to have creative workplace, they're moving in retrofitting existing buildings. There are a number of reasons for that because they're beautiful and we all love them. But there's something else about that too: connecting to places that were formerly useful, a sense of place. Workplace in general is changing. This idea that you leave a thing called a home and go to a thing called work is all changing. So people are choosing to work in places much more like hospitality or, or a residential building. So all that's changed. So this building is designed primarily at, from the upper floors, from the second floor up, as a workplace of the future. So for creative companies, you can fill in the blank, name the three. Those are all people that we, we had in mind uh, when we designed this. Um, we have the benefit that we're doing 1.3 million for Google headquarters down at the St. John's terminal right now. So we're thinking about what do people seek, the creative workplace that you see. On top of that, it's about lifestyle, and instead of having everything internalized to a local tenant, we wanted the ground floor to be active and have retail. So we've, we've, we've planned for a and B, this is basically an entry into the workplace right here. The purple is designed to be a great bicycle entrance, not an entrance through a loading dock, but a really front door experience. The blue up there is retail, the blue there is retail. This entire yellow is viewed as an open market hall. And you know, we like is what the plan is right now. Um, the blue here is retail. This is for an office tenant. The blue there is retail. The blue there is retail. The blue there is retail. The blue here is retail. The blue here is retail. And the blue here is retail. So we wanted a rich, varied streetscape. We wanted the tunnel to be activated. The whole floor plan is uh, about 130,000 square feet. All of the retail altogether is about 70,000 square feet. About 70,000 square feet of pure retail. Um, and I, I think that might have answered your question. I think so. So you said, did you say 1.3 million offers? Uh 1.3 is rentable. And I looked at them in. It's uh, 1 million square feet of office, 60,000 square feet of retail, and 70,000 square feet of lobbies, the tunnel, and the loading. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but, but thank you also for really discussing the true concept behind the building, the, you know, this idea of a workplace that has to uh, do with the way many companies are working today and, and workers are working with them today. Any other questions? Okay, so I think we will move to our discussion. Thank you very much. For Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah. Um, where this project means creating um, this large courtyard and center, that I would assume is interior space is not governed by us. Am I wrong or is that correct? Um, question. I mean, I think that it's, 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 um, it's now a courtyard. Now a courtyard. Um, so it's different than a donut and a brownstone. Yeah. 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 Um, in the past, we have not regulated these sort of scooped out areas when they were created and now it's been adaptively reused um, buildings. Thank you. Well, we have regulated those scooped out areas when they're part of the original structure. Correct. Right. And if they were to scoop out that area and destroy the building, then it would be all right. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Any, any, any uh, 
effect on the exterior. If any work that would have any effect on the exterior of the building structure, that would obviously be there. That's why we're, we're looking at it. We can look at it for purposes of its effect, <coughs> effect on the exterior and that sort of thing. That's really where. And I think, you know, there's a, a lot to this project, and as it's been presented, you know, the concept is a very comprehensive one that I think there's, and the applicants, I think, are striving for sort of an authenticity within this approach. And so, while even the wood timbers on the interior are not necessarily under our purview, I think we can certainly discuss about the project conceptually and comprehensively and consider all of these aspects, I think. The idea that much of this habit is being retained, I think, is a real positive. So, as we start our discussion, I think maybe the best way to kind of frame our comments is kind of to start with the big picture adaptive reuse concept, and then um, you know maybe get to then the, the the scoop out and the addition, the largest um, accretion to the building, and then maybe talk about the windows and then maybe some of the openings. The, storefronts and loading bays, and then the sort of more minimal accretions that are reversible, like the canopy, signage, and ramps. Um, and I think that might help us to organize our time to make sure that. Fred, would you like to start? Thank you. Um, I'll thank the uh, team, the other American Texas team, too, for bringing forth what uh, I don't know, 11 plus years, I think, is among the, if not the most, um, I'm using two words here, lyrical and erudite uh, presentation that I've um, seen uh, on, uh, sitting at this table for all these years. Um, erudite, because it's intellectually responsible, uh, deep dive into the history, um, and the evolution of the building over time, I think, was extraordinarily important uh, to build a case uh, for uh, some what might be seen as radical changes. Um, lyrical, because they're lyrical in the presentation. And, you know, and I think that Homer, using love language, must have helped that lyricism. But it certainly uh, was appreciated by me, and I think, again, I just think it's an unusual and exciting moment uh, for me to, to witness this uh, presentation. And I'm glad it occurred, it's now occurred over two, uh, two days, uh, two different times. I think that lets it sink in a little bit more. Um, I want to start, and I'm not going to have to speak all that long, allowing many people to speak, because I, I you know, focus on just couple of things really. There's so many things to focus on, I'll just focus on those things that I would be able to ponder. But I want to start by saying um, this. Uh, long before I was ever a commissioner, I was just a mere applicant here at this table, a supplicant you might say, at this table from time to time. Um, um, and I view projects like this not as, as has been advertised here, Application is to construct rooftop additions, replace windows, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, long after I leave this table, I will still feel that that's not the right way to think of it. I understand that's been the tradition probably from the beginning of um, time for the Landmarks Commission to think of this as a rooftop addition. I simply don't view it that way. I view it as as a, as a new building built around the adaptive use of a historic uh, remnant of uh, a past. It's really a new building. And to me, it's the most exciting architecture extant today all over the world when this happens. It's much more difficult to do intellectually. It's much more difficult to achieve um, uh, from a design point of view, because every little piece has to be thought through. Is this appropriate? Is it the right way uh, to respond to the old piece? Whether it's the whole, whole ensemble or an individual tiny piece of it, uh, it is so much more exciting to me than a twisted, glassy building somewhere in nowhere. This is the most exciting architecture there can be for me, and 
therefore, all of that allows me then to take some liberties, you might say, with a more conservative approach. And I respect anybody's conservative approach. I'm just expressing mine first. Um, so I'll, I'll start actually with two little ones, and then I'll go to the big one, Sarah, and, and in the opposite direction. Two things gave me a little bit of pause, and uh, I took my book home with me. Now I have a second book. Timber's, timbers falling all over some farms. Rick, you got to think about that, sustainability. Um, so um, the first one were the windows. Um, previously, we got a, had an approval here for this building to do a series of windows. You come with one uh, blow out of everything with uh, mullionless glass. Uh, I wanted to be sure, historically, in my own judgment, I think others may feel differently, and I would kind of respect that. But I came to the conclusion that this is the right thing to do in this case. Uh, you made the case that the windows were often uh, viewed in shadow, they're deeply recessed, they often had uh, shutters, chronic uh, shrouding them, let's say. Um, and again, retreating into my philosophy that this is a new building, really, um, uh, I accept the modernist glass throughout. I think it, it, it uh, somehow uh, emphasizes the, the roundness of the tops of those buildings, uh, of those windows. And I, I, I simply like it, and I think it's appropriate. Um, the loading door uh, system of blowing out a whole series of existing doors, even though those have, have been changed over time, gave me some pause with that too much. And I, again, I concluded no, because it was um, setting up a resolution for a bigger problem, which you illustrated very well by the lack of control of, of the loading. So, so those were resolved in my head over the last, uh, is it been two weeks since we met? Yeah. Um, in my head, I thought a lot about it. Um, and then the final thing, and the biggest thing, the most obvious thing is, what about that visible rooftop addition? Which, in my judgment, of course, is not a rooftop addition, but part of this new building that's created out of new and old parts. Um, I spent um, an hour at least covering out parts of the the top floor, wondering if we should cut a floor off or something like that. And I just didn't see that the building was any better because of that. I didn't see that uh, we're still going to see it. And I think it's exciting, frankly, to see that new piece emerging from um, emerging from the bottom. Um, I won't even go into uh, all the details of why I think this architecture is so significant. Uh, I mean, the new part, just the new part, who would have thought that it could spring from boxcars or from uh, subway cars? Uh, that's part of the erudition of this whole proposal and the uh, beauty of the, uh, of the final design uh, with its x bracing uh, and glass and, and uh, the signature that we've begun to admiring Rick's work of, uh, of gardens in the sky. So I'll leave it at, at that, but I think I want to say one more thing. To me, this is a very comfortable um, and appropriate um, uh, melding of what could have been a very strong, uh, I'll, I'll say fingerprint almost on the building. I don't always admire architects who leave a strong fingerprint of their own style on a historic setting. Um, and I'm, I'm looking at uh, Richard Rogers' scheme that we just approved. That was a, that was a pretty, pretty strong fingerprint, uh, but a pretty, pretty clever thing. So we approved it. Uh, to me, this is less like that, and therefore it's even more appropriate. It's a real wonderful mesh of a new vocabulary uh, a specific uh, Rick Cook vocabulary uh, to me that melts brilliantly with the old and very comfortably without pressing too hard to make that statement uh, a fingerprint, let's say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
those entrances work well and they uh, take away the need for canopies, <laughs> which can often more <coughs> these wonderful old buildings. Um, I, I appreciate the fact that, you know, when, when you go back and you look at the, some of the buildings that you brought up, the, like the Domino Sugar um, Factory, I mean, because that building, just like this building, wasn't built to accommodate the kind of use that's going into it, you know, the exterior of the building always has to be a sleeve. And it is a sleeve and there's an insert. In a way, you're doing it a little differently, but you're doing the same thing. And I'm, and I and I um, so I think that I appreciate how you're thinking of configuring the space, the fact that you're activating the outside and the inside. I um, was thinking at the. I think the windows at the ground level are an appropriate size and opening. I especially like the fact that you were taking the um, loading off the street. The city is so congested. There's so much traffic, especially um, east-west traffic. And to take it off the street and alleviate some of that traffic and also enhance the pedestrian experience, of which there's going to be a lot, given the amount of square footage in this building, I think is, is, is important. Um, retaining the trees and adding more, I think, is also going to be critical to enlivening um, the streetscape and it's good for the environment. You know, it's such a big project, it's worth to comment on everything. So um, I think that there are probably some things that you're going to want to work with staff on, and that is some of the particulars about the signage. Those signs on the side of the building that would be used for tenants. I, mean, I think I would prefer if there could be some flexibility there in terms of the number of sizes. If the Google comes and takes the whole building, then how many signs do you need? Um, if you, you know, so I think it, it, you might want to think about limiting them um, to particular extent because we don't really need to have the building banner with the names of the corporate tenants. That would take away from the building. Um, and then I think at the base of the building where the retail is, I just want to make sure that I, I you know, forgot or I'm not really sure how recessed the retail glass is, but I feel like it shouldn't be flush with the street wall. And Seven. Yeah, it's seven. Right. Okay. Okay. So I'm okay with that. And let's see if there's anything else. I think that's it. Okay. Yeah. And do you have any particular thoughts about the windows? I, I actually think the windows are fine. I mean, again, oh, I do want to talk about the top of the That's good. Okay. That's all right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's good though. So I'm actually, I'm okay with it. Uh, it's a big building, I don't think it overwhelms it. I don't think it gets in the way of Sarah Lehigh. Um, and I think it supports, you know, the news and stuff like that. Thank you. And Gerardo, would you like to comment? This is a, an urban typology that exists now. You know, you have a masonry base and you're adding two glass pieces to this building. And the idea here is contrast. Architecture. 
heavy case like. And based on the, the sensitivity of that, the architect is the window is the sensitivity of the vertical alignment of the base, I think. I agree with the with the case. My issue is the center of the I think the addition of the Western block is it's a little too complicated somehow. I think. The relationship of the base and the Western block, I'm just talking about the um, it's, it's too complicated for me. I think it can be simplified. I'm not quite sure the need for the campus. There's some issues that are not compelled by it. Um, the idea of, of, of the narrative of it being the top of the block, um, I'll find out in a minute. If it's the image of it, perhaps, if it, because of the distance from the beehive, um, from the beehive building. You can see them with a composition, good neighbors. I can buy that, I can buy the colors. Um, but the complexity of that support, uh, kind of a 1960s complex element in that space. John? I'll be very brief here. I think the only the only um, area where I have some concern is is on that western uh, portion. And if you look at page uh, 69, um, I know everyone is uh, seems to try to discount views that are from outside the district, which really is irrelevant. Um, it's, it's a public view, a public place, and so it's the same um, weight as any other view. Uh, and indeed, some of the uh, most spectacular views of this building are from uh, from from. Uh, the uh, from West Street. Um, when you look at that view, I think that's where I, I actually like the railroad car idea, um, uh, and I tend to discount all of that kind of intellectual side of it. Um, but um, but I think what my problem is is that I lose that railroad car view with that with the glass on top of it. So. Um, it's sort of, and I, I do agree uh, with Everardo on that. It's, there's something too much going on there that takes away from from the image that we're trying to present, or they're trying to present of this uh, railroad car uh, idea. Um, so um, I think that needs to be, um, if, you, if they would rethink all the other stuff going on above, the, the, the sort of three bands of steel, all the stuff that's going on above that third, the top band of steel, I think that's what really is uh, uh, the issue for me. I'm fine with the, with the glass, I'm fine with the windows, and I'm fine with the uh, uh, changes in the, in the signage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's the only thing I would have to do. I think it's hard enough. Um, I think I agree with so much of what this was said about the, the, kind of the general approach to the um, adaptive use. Um, typically, I, I, I don't think that I favor replacing a variety of windows with one type and certainly not one um, un, uh, sort of a broken paint or fenestration. But in this case, I think it, it actually works because of setbacks. The signage is, for the most part, fine. Although all of these approaches are somewhat, the, the kind of the comprehensive approach, as you, you described it, is a little bit um, strange on the building. I think it didn't, it was not originally sort of all built a, a, a single edifice in terms of its image. Um, and so doing it all at once with all the same kind of sign and all the same kind of um, approach to the windows sort of spruces it up in a way that's, that it's just about this moment, I suppose. And so uh, it, in the end, it, it saves the building and one reads the historic building uh, very well, I think. Um, I think the place that I have an argument with the premise uh, of the uh, with your premise is has to do with the addition and uh, and what is not in the new package that was in the previous I think presentation 
was that, at, or at least I remember your um, telling us, showing us uh, one image of the historic building and the many elevator shafts. Um, and the many elevator shafts, you said, were kind of, how were you going to solve that? How were you going to knit those or, or translate those? And I think that on some level, that opportunity was missed. You went to the language of the boxcar and the influence of the stair at Lehigh in terms of this kind of horizontality. So you mounted these horizontal, you know, glass kind of elements uh, on top of the building. And I think that that is a miss in terms of um, what could have happened in terms of the addition. The addition, in, in, my, in my view, in order to kind of continue the language of these, this, this multi bay or stored building would have been to have a kind of a vertical turret language on top. Glass, yes, but um, not one that referenced the several decades forward horizontality of the in, in international style building or, or earlier than slightly earlier than that. Um, and and still and close to kind of what you said, particular to this building, would have been something that had kind of modulated sets of, of vertical elements that would have also kind of disappeared, it, it would seem to me, behind the masonry, or allowed for the masonry to be uh, the, the way that it does. So, uh, you know, that's just kind of an argument with the approach. Uh, I, I think that it's what you've done is not too big or not too small or doesn't um, undermine the historic building. It just doesn't sort of make sense to me. It's always dangerous to do more than five minutes to think about something. I wind up saying too much, so I apologize in advance. But um, I agree that the presentation was remarkable. With its depth and its thoroughness, I'll even go for lyricality. Um, but I, I, I think I disagree with the conclusions taken from it in the form that, that, that has resulted in some ways. I don't disagree with the overall volume or mass, uh, but I, I think that a, a number of decisions cause me uh, concern. Um, first of all, I, I appreciated the applicants comparing and looking at the project through the lens of other projects that we've seen as adaptive reuses, significant adaptive reuse of additions. Uh, that's, I try to look at it that way too, and, and I think in, in looking at how he looks at the precedence, so that word to use, um, I can try to understand what, what's different about this that I find uh, concerning. I think the Domino project was an appropriate project to look at, um, but it was different. That was a, an empty shell um, and is treated as such in the addition. Uh, I, I don't think that this building is similar to, to the Domino in its earlier form, because I think Domino truly was a scheme that had no reference at all to what was going on inside. This has floors, this has walls, this has columns, and the windows line up with the, oh, there's a building, it's a warehouse. It's, you know, it has a cool tunnel in the middle of it, that's, that's unusual, but it, it's a warehouse. So I think that the notion that one can toss out the histor historic form of the building because it was a shell that's a, that's a losing argument for me, whereas I think it was an appropriate argument for Domino. Now, the, the Domino addition, or insertion, was a volume that completely doesn't touch and can be completely kind of imagined away when you look at it by They're dissociated. They're physically dissociated. The, the, the Domino box is set in five, ten feet, whatever it is, from the shell. And you can see that. Light will come into the shell and hit the glass 10 feet in, there'll be shadows. It's a totally different experience. The same, the same effect, in a funny way, happened at the Otis building. The, the, the Richard Rogers addition, the, the ballsiness of it, was its elevation above the building to such an extent that you really always see space, lots of space between the building and the historic building. 
right? the new building they struck. So there again, there was a separation between the radical gesture and the historic element that allowed for you to see both at the same time and have the integrity of both maintained. I think this project is a lot more, a lot more similar to the Empire Stores building um, in Dumbo, where you had a, a warehouse that uh, was also a, a ruin for a period of time, was burnt out, I think, and that was restored in a contemporary way, using the exact same kind of windows that are proposed here, with a significant one-story visible rooftop addition. Um, and so, in thinking about this, I really don't think that this is analogous kind of as, as approach, as a concept, to Domino or to Otis. I think it's much more analogous to the Empire Story. And, it, and whether that, you know, who cares? How does it build, how does it work? I think that um, the initial concept of scooping out real estate and sticking it on top is, is fine. I personally question the approach taken. I think that the use of a square courtyard that eviscerates or, or kind of, you know, obliterates to some extent the rhythmic quality of the, of the volumes of the buildings that was shown in, in the kind of, there was a checkerboard diagram early on in the first presentation where you see the, the individual units, each store. I think that the, the courtyard in its shape doesn't pay enough respect to the volumes of the building as they were. I could have seen a, a courtyard that was much more linear, that kind of brought the tunnel up. I could have seen something that kind of somehow played on the, the, the party walls of the individual buildings and maintained them. For me, the, the excavation of a square courtyard kind of takes, and, and how the elevations of that interior part were developed, to me, they, it, it kind of obliterates that rhythmic quality that is essential to the building. We may or may not have a basis to comment on it, so I just wanted to get that out there. I think that the, um, the rooftop addition, I share uh, Everardo's concern. Uh, and for me, the thing that, that's, that's, that struck me about it was the in and out of the, of the balconies that face west. Uh, that kind of reminded me a little bit of uh, Expo 67 of, of Habitat. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the changes in the volume on the, on the roof that, that, um, uh, that John noted uh, take away from the clarity of it. I, I think that if you look at Domino and you look at Otis, the simplicity of the addition, the self-contained volumetric quality of the additions make them sit better with the uh, building. This to me feels a lot more like a rooftop addition, kind of similar to Puck. And that brought up, that, that resonated with me when, when one of the testimony people had, had suggested rebuilding the parapets on the corners of the building. At Puck, the, uh, the uh, parapets were brought up, the historic parapets were rebuilt, and that helped obscure and kind of set into the background the, um, the significant addition. I think that would be a, a something that they should consider here. Uh, I think that the scale of the windows is another area where, um, where this scheme seemed less successful than others. If you look at, at the Otis building, for instance, the scheme of the, you know, the scale of the fenestration has an echo to Starrett Lehigh. It, it pays a kind of respect to the industrial sash window that is so predominant in the neighborhood. This scale seems to me more like, it, it, my first reaction was it looked like sliding doors. They, they, had, they had a very residential proportion to them that I didn't feel belonged either to the building below or to the district or as a good contrast. I just didn't, I, I felt that it kind of drew energy away from the addition. Um, I also think that the module of the train car, which is the module of the building, doesn't read for me. Maybe I'm missing it, but I see much more of an alternating kind of uh, uh, a, uh, an ash the brick rhythm where, where uh, in this image, right, where you see every other bay of, of steel is kind of highlighted um, as opposed to the kind of more vertical, regular rhythm of buildings below and presumably a, a the stack uh, uh, subway cars or something. Um, so I just didn't get that, um, I didn't get that, that feeling of the building kind of coming up or relating to the, to the building below. Uh, I think in terms of the windows that when I, when I saw the Empire Stores building and its approach to its windows, I felt that 
it was less successful as the, it was supposed to kind of end, uh, do exactly what what is proposed here, where it's really it's really the void. It's not the window. These were windows. They were always seen as windows. They've been seen as windows since the building was built. I, they exist as windows today. I think they should be windows. I think that the contrast between the building and the addition will be better if these are historic in, in quality. I don't think it has to be the 15 over 15s. It can be. I think the uniformity of it is fine, but I don't think that the um, uh, single pane for me works. I think that the storefront uh, system is really beautiful. The, the emollient system chosen and the, flood, the floodgates decisions were really well done. Um, I think that the uh, storefronts too, here you have a chance to, to argue for, I think, the open glass because these were uh, presented, were, were often either unfenestrated or, or open all the time. So I think there's an argument for that that I could, I could accept. I think the loading dock approach is, is fine. The canopies and lamps are fine. I think there's way too much uh, uh, lighting. I think the up lighting, and these buildings are characterized by their gloominess, their weight, their, their, you know, I think that's kind of their beauty. You know, the Sarah Behind is so, it glows. It's all glass. This is heavy. If you take away from that, when you turn into a theater, uh, I think it's too much up light. I think the down light's fine. The canopies are fine. And I personally think the blades are not supported on this building historically. I think that um, uh, the painted signs and the canopy are fine. Thank you. Michael? I have a lead yield my time to my colleague, Ms. Mike Paradise, and that's pretty much most of the feelings that I have about this. Um, I, I applaud the adaptive reuse of this building, and I think it's generally the, uh, the process is very well done. Um, specifics, I think, I think the, the loading that doors, uh, that whole change in the building is, is very much a positive thing toward the adaptive reuse of this building. I agree with Everardo and my other colleagues about the, uh, the too much of, of the addition. It, it's its massing is is monstrous, and the, and the top portion of it just doesn't seem to make sense with the other box cut uh, modulus that they're they're speaking about. I think the the elevator bulkheads that that those masses are really problematic for me. Um, Again, the, the, as I asked the question, and I don't think I really had an answer this time about why it's necessary to trash original windows on this building, um, I'm still not convinced that um, somehow just throwing out the master plan that I think uh, was relatively well thought out by the staff here and, and the commissioners is something that needs to happen, although it could be essentially modified. For me, windows are a character-defining element of a building, and they tell the story. And if, if the moment in time, which is this adaptive reuse, which we think is great, is something that destroys elements that are part of, of the significance of this building, I don't think it's an appropriate approach. And so um, I'm never going to be on board with, with making this look like an abandoned building again. I'm totally on board with uh, the reestablishment of the, sh the shutters. Um, I agree with Michael. I think the lighting absolutely needs to be rethought when you're, when you're up lighting the water tanks on top of the building. I think you've gone to an absurd level of lighting, and that needs to be rethought. The signage as well, I think, would be toned down a little bit with the help of uh, staff. Well, I'll keep it very brief. I, I think that, uh, as been said, this is a very well thought out, uh, excellent presentation. Uh, I think the challenge for the site is obviously you have a, a, that, you have a, a very deep, elongated building that needs to be uh, readapted for the next century use. And so you we encounter a challenge here about you know, how do you preserve the timber, uh, create a, a light and air, 
when the building is way too deep. So I called the, uh, the applicant in, uh, in coming up with this light bulb idea. Uh, just as we were to work with a tenant in the building, you know, the power analogy. And I, I like the idea of unifying uh, with the tunnel. But though I must say it's a sad commentary that of the 1.1 million square feet, only 60,000 is going to be used for retail. That shows you the state of the brick and mortar retail. Um, in our living age. Uh, I have no problem with the, uh, the insertion of a new uh, Richard Roger type of uh, structure. Uh, just as we have done with Domino, uh, just as we have done with the oldest building. If anything, I think this is a nice counterbalance to the spirit and the scale of the district. Uh, it anchors the western end facing the west side highway. Uh, and I think it is appropriate. Uh, I, I agree with the community board. I think that you, you basically have two approaches in terms of the window. Uh, obviously, if you do it uh, with different modules, uh, you will have more texture, more variety, and, and a better way to read the building. Uh, but if you're aiming for light and air, and the app controls the over light and air, so that it's a clean look, uh, I, I, I'm, I can go along with that, uh, but I, I do uh, think that if they want to reconsider and working with the staff uh, to make it uh, adding variety to it and, 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 and modularity to it. Um, the loading of the program, I think that, that the comment about Google is an excellent one. This is basically not going to be a giant uh, workspace and I think that the, the term ground scraper is the appropriate description for it. I think that if you're going to, uh, if you do have a giant tenant, then I think it would be the signage and, and the, uh, the scale about the, uh, the, as Michael said, uh, uh, of those play signs uh, may need to be studied. But overall, I think it's very, very well done and I think it is exciting to open life. Uh, I have less problem. I, I, you know, I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty in terms of lighting. Uh, I do think that in an area that's formerly industrial, uh, now that we're adding uh, trees and greenery, uh, at night time, if you have people coming off at work, you may need more light. Like, uh, go on, I think it's like some part. Thank you. And nobody really commented on the new line of windows in the taller portion. Signage, 
there have been some comments about thinking about those blade signs or limiting signage for tenants. That's something that we think about. And you know, we're sort of split on the single pane windows. Uh, but I think that as you are thinking about this project as a very kind of authentic approach to the building, that it may be worth studying the, the fenestration and how that ties into that narrative as well. We do think that Empire Stores and Tobacco Warehouse, those buildings historically didn't have windows. They just had the shutters for the goods to come in and the switch in. So I think you can actually come up with a revised window plan that hopefully still can achieve the light needs you have and still speak to that kind of authenticity of the building that you're striving for. And, and uh, you're right, this probably never, except the day it's over, didn't have any appointments or some So I think there's some flexibility for the buildings. And then I think um, for most commissioners, the overall volume of the addition sits comfortably, but there were a number of comments on the design. And I think for some, those design comments could also affect their level of comfort with the size. So I think conceptually, everybody feels this is a very large, massive building that can handle uh, a new uh, comp complementary addition as part of this adaptive reuse, and that stacking it on the western end makes sense and sort of relating to the history of this building. It's uh, about circulation and construction, which also is comfortable, but I think that there are some design ideas and thoughts that were mentioned at the table that um, will be you know, something for you to think about, and I think I'll leave it to you to think about how to interpret those and reconcile some of those comments. So the process post I think that this project should be a model for large-scale projects, not only in terms of the detail and particularity of the, of the presentation, but in the Commission's approach to it. It may just have happened that it was at the end of the day, but it was great um, because it gave us and them the time to focus on the project. I think the comments proved that out, that they were much more you know, detailed and fine grain than, than we sometimes are able to get to because of the amount of time we had, the amount of time they had, the depth of the presentation. So, okay. so we won't take an action today, but I think this is very exciting. I think you are in a good place and can think a little bit more creatively about some of these aspects, and we'll see you back as soon as you're ready. Thank you. For that. Thank you.
September 17th, the Commissioner supported the demolition of the existing non-contributing building and discussed areas of the development, including the design and height of the storefronts, proposed the of the secondary facades, the design and details of the color of the primary facades, and the height and mass of the bulkheads. Uh, David Gross of GF55 uh, Architects is here to respond to these concerns and address the changes to the proposal and answer any questions. Thank you. We have a motion to open the proceedings. Thank you for this opportunity to present our project again. We're very excited about it, and we hope you like it. We try very hard to do what we to your concerns. Just to recap, it's a six. It's a seven-story building. It's six stories with a penthouse. It's um, well within the legal limit of uh, how you call the height of that bulk. Um, we're trying to do something that's not a historicist or modern. We're trying to do something that's a, a blend that is inspired by the past, but clearly of the present. Uh, these are uh, comparative elevation, which shows you that we the windows of uh, uh, shorter, skinnier, narrower. We made the, we increased the height of the base to give it visual um, weight so that the building would seem compressed at the base. We made the piers wider at the base. We increased the um, cornice. We made the top floor so that the cornice stood, stood out from the property line uh, limited by the uh, building code so that when you saw the uh, building in perspective, the impact of anything above the cornice itself, above the six-story regulating uh, height, would be minimized because of the perspectival um, laws of perspective. perspective. We eliminate the horizontal bands and turn them into horizontal reveals, so all the details of the building now are all carved uh, in size rather than some sticking out and some um, not. We minimize the visual impact of the uh, penthouse by removing some of the details to make it a little uh, softer and much more secondary and more recessive. We change the color of the penthouse so that it disappears visually as you look at the building facade. We lower the bulkhead, the overall bulkhead height by one foot eight. The mechanical room itself we eliminated. We put it in the basement. We Elevator in the basement. The elevator bulkhead itself is four foot ten, almost five feet lower. And um, we consolidated the safety railing on the mechanical bulkhead with the um, railing that uh, screened the penthouse. Uh, so we made a lot of subtle differences. We framed the uh, building symmetrically along the front and the side so that it has a strong rectilinear here. You can see the before and after of the penthouse. Uh, we minimize the height and reduce it physically as much as possible. We turn the corner now with um, brick instead of ethos. Uh, we have a soldier course um, detail, which is simply a vertical uh, course of brick that aligns with the floor that registers the um, Trading system of the facade onto the side so that the building is not so much of a blank wall on the side. You can see we reduced the bulkhead and plan quite a bit. You can see the uh, reduction of the bulkhead in the red line. So this is the detail of how it gets made. Um, you can see that the proportions of the building have gotten, um, I think, more harmonious with uh, the area. That's a view, that's a perspectival view standing on the sidewalk. That's the original schemes on the top and the updated schemes on the lower. That's a comparison of the uh, original windows versus the updated scheme. That's a comparison on the left, the 
and we see the bulk head much more prominently. We also toned down the color in response to your comments and we felt, we felt it was going to be too bright in the sunlight. So we have a limestone color of the, our uh, facade and I think it's actually more beautiful because depending on the time of the day, depending on the time of the day, it will have different characteristics. Obviously when the bright sun is on it in the summer afternoon, it will be very light, but otherwise it will be softer like you see it. And um, you can see that the base is much taller and more of the line with its uh, neighbors and shorten every floor to accommodate that. And this is the view um, along the street. We see that the, there's a real material or brick on the side, not a not a lupus. And that's the view at the corner of the Brisbane Church. We tweaked it, we tweaked it, we tweaked it, we tweaked it, we re-rendered it, and uh, I think it, it fits on, I hope you see it fits on the other one. Are there any questions?
Okay, let's move to our discussion. Thank you. Come on, let's see. So as I said, I wasn't here, but my understanding is that generally when we saw this last time, the commission was comfortable with the overall street wall height and general massing and the general uh, approach with the arch administration and the precast concrete material for the street walls. And, but that there were some concerns about proportions, particularly the base and the vertical proportions of the windows as well as the size of the penthouse and the material on the side elevations. And I think it addressed each of those so, comments um, so that people feel that it's achieved the goal that you can lay out. Okay. I, I just want to say um, quickly, it, it's always great when you know, projects are tweaked and they're made even better. And I think that maybe a change in color on the facade and the treatment of the materials has been a really wonderful addition. It's very excellent. Good. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in the matter of uh, 31 33 West Merritt Street in Tribeca East Historic District, uh, this is uh, an application to demolish the existing building to construct a new building. I know that the uh, neighboring buildings on Church Street include a four story store and loft building featuring pointed, uh, sorry, painted. Uh, stone cladding and cast iron elements in smaller late 20th century masonry clad buildings uh, featuring red, brown, and gray colors, and that the neighboring buildings on West Bernard uh, consist primarily of four to six story store and loft buildings featuring brick cladding, stone trim, and cast iron elements with a mix of red, orange, beige, and gray tones. Uh, I further note that the Lisbonard streetscape also includes some stone and stucco clad buildings and darker finishes, as well as a nine story store, loft, and office buildings, a two story bank building, and a one story 20th century building. Lastly, I note that the western side of Church Street facing this building is outside of the district and that there are significant number of buildings with cast iron fronts throughout the historic district, including some on Church Street. Um, so I recommend approval, noting that the building is not one of the buildings for which the historic district was designated. Therefore, its demolition will not detract from special historic and architectural character, character of the historic district. But the proposed building's height and massing will be consistent with the height and massing at historic uh, store and loft buildings throughout the historic district, including nearby buildings within the Lisbonard and Church Street's uh, streetscape. But the presence of the six-story street facades of the building adjacent to the immediate one and four-story neighboring buildings will be consistent with the historic development of the portion of, uh, of this portion of Church Street within the historic district, which includes similar juxtapositions of buildings and diff of different heights. That the plane of the proposed street facades will um, align with the facades of adjacent properties, thereby reinforcing the street wall, a significant consistent feature of the historic district. But the bulkhead and the pentagons of the um, will be moderate in size and set back from the front facades, thereby not overwhelming the building. That the height of the building base will recall the taller bases historically found on uh, at buildings of this size within the historic district and will relate well to the base height of neighboring buildings within, the, within streetscape views. That the prominent aspects of the design, including the storms, framing at the corners and the storefront, as well as the regular grid pattern featuring vertically oriented arch openings and piers and horizontal bands, similar uh, in scale uh, to cast iron uh, framing elements, will recall historic cast iron buildings, thereby helping the building to harmonize, to harmonize with the space that the presence of a building 
featuring cast iron inspired elements adjacent to masonry buildings will be consistent with the evolution of this historic district, which includes some cast iron buildings individually built adjacent to masonry buildings. That this use of precast concrete, including its, its texture, profiles, and materials, will recall in a contemporary way the historic use of cast iron to reflect earlier building materials while also helping to maintain the building's identity as a modern construction. That the combination of the profiles and details of the precast concrete will help the design to subtly recall the articulation of historic cast iron designs. That the brick cladding of the lot line facades will be consistent with the character of historic treatments and secondary facades of buildings within the, the surrounding streetscape and throughout the historic uh, district. That the details and proportions of the demonstration <coughs> will help the windows to be consistent in character with the windows of buildings of this size throughout the historic district. That the composition of the floor, including piers, display windows, bulkheads, and entrance doors will be compatible with the commercial character of the basis of buildings throughout the historic district, and that the marquee is simply designed and relates to the building design and is well scaled to the entrance, thereby helping it um, remain a harmonious secondary presence within the streetscape. Questions? 
to alter masonry openings and construct balconies at the, set, at the rear facade and to construct a rooftop addition. The applicants are here to discuss the details of the proposal, and with that, I'll turn the podium over to them. We have a motion to open the proceedings to the applicant and public.
uh, the view on the left that you're looking at is the mock-up uh, that was prepared uh, to show the uh, to show the enlargement of the bulkhead on the roof uh, and the portion of the bulkhead that's extended further up. You can see in blue is where the elevator needs to be extended in order to accommodate the machine room uh, for the elevator to service the roof. Uh, and the right is a rendering that, that shows what we propose to do to finish on the bulkhead. And the sixth floor that is, that is set up. Uh, the uh, the chimneys uh, that you see over yeah, there in the front, uh, on, the, on the two sides near the front of the building, those chimneys are abandoned and no longer being used for fireplaces. This slide, this slide shows the, uh, the site line <coughs> um, to show where the setbacks are. Uh, where the existing setback is at the sixth floor level and uh, what we're proposing uh, at the roof for the bulkhead. There's a glass enclosed uh, elevator um, vestibule. And then uh, what you see on the perimeter is the proposed glass room. Uh, the building is to be used as a uh, apartment building. Um, it's being proposed that the uh, first floor and cellar is a duplex apartment in the rear. The front of the first floor is a superintendent's office. Uh, and then the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth floors are individual floor apartments. Uh, so, the, so the roof is to be used as a amenity to the building, the roof deck. Um, and that's why we're, it's one reason why we're enlarging the elevator uh, the, uh, the stairwell. The drawing on the right came from our elevator people that are showing the, uh, the construction of the, of the elevator. The elevator book. Uh, again, it's a view showing uh, what, what can be seen from the street. We can barely see the, uh, the elevator book at this point. So this is a view from Park Avenue, three views as you get closer to the building. And then these are three views coming from Madison Avenue as you get closer to the building. <coughs> this is the roof plan showing exactly uh, how we're doing the enlargement. A portion of the building you can see is the elevator. Uh, another question is the stair and the proposed bathroom as a amenity to the occupants of the building using the roof terrace. Uh, these are elevation views. The upper left um, is the same as what you just saw, just uh, enlarged. You can see the detail of the glass railing, the glass uh, elevator. Uh, vestibule enclosure and the elevator bulkhead. The bottom left is uh, from the other direction. <coughs> and the upper right uh, is a view uh, from the rear of the building. So you're seeing the sixth floor, the glass railing, <coughs> the roof level on the side of the bulkhead and uh, glass enclosure. Uh, 
again, the orange is the bulkhead, uh, the primary bulkhead, and the blue is the elevator uh, extension, elevator bulkhead extension. You can see from the, uh, the image on the left that we're proposing um, uh, balconies uh, coming off of the apartments in the rear um, from the second to the fifth floors. Um, the balconies are limited to just that little recess in, you know, in the building. So it only comes to where the angle's back. So this is the point which the balconies are coming. Uh, the rest of the windows can be referred to as the tail of the building. The portion of the building that is narrow that extends to the rear lot line. Those windows are being uh, uh, replaced and enlarged in some cases, as you can see. We have the pairs of windows. This is the rear. This is the rear stair, and then this is the usable space within the building. So we're actually opening up the brick that this ring between and making a triple, a triple double hung uh, window. This elevation view of the proposing existing. And you can see where how we're modifying the. Uh, the openings in the rear of masonry to accommodate the new windows and the rest of the balconies. Okay, are there any questions? Please and testimony and then come back. I have one. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, just to go back to page, uh, I just want to go back to this concept of their balcony that might have that either was or might have been on um, page six. I just want to make sure I'm seeing this correctly. So, okay, is that curved, that balcony? Is it curved? Is it the, the drawing? The drawing, yeah. Yeah, it's a little ripple. Okay, all right. Is so. that the condition? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Sure. The balcony is straight. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Felicia Mayro. Felicia Mero, representing Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts. Chair Carroll and Conway Commissioners, Friends Preservation Committee commends the applicant for sourcing the archival drawings from the Ogden Carbon Collection as a reference for the full length balcony intended to be installed at the second floor of the front facade. However, despite this preliminary study, the final design is built by Carbon appears to be the two graciously proportioned, um, excuse me, graciously modest balconies that are made today. These two smaller railings complement proportions of the window, and Friends sees no need to alter an intact carbon design. Retention of the two railings would add to the restorative work at the front facade, which could be further enhanced by stripping the paint or stucco material at the base to reveal the stonework as per the tax photo. With regard to the rooftop and the rear yard, both are already very large, although not as large as the depiction of the existing sixth floor in the current conditions drawings which is shown as occupying the full width of the building. The proposed bulkhead enlargement adds to its um, cumulative effect and could be further reduced to minimize its visibility. Meanwhile, the combined masonry openings at the rear in combination with the very large balconies impart an unfortunate institutional feeling to the elegant residents. Friends Preservation Committee encourages the FPC to uphold the intact carbon design at the front and work with the applicant to minimize the impact of the roof plot I'm here for alterations. Thank you. Thank you. Brittany Thomas. Brittany Thomas is Council. HTC asks that the top story windows catch openings be preserved in continuity of LPC practice on rear facade alterations. This is a large intervention of two rear facades, and HTC wonders if there is precedent in the Upper East Side Historic District for enlarging openings to this extent to allow that. Finally, the rooftop addition at bulk height is extremely large and requires further study. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this application? Okay. Resolution from Committee Board 8 recommending approval of the application and uh, commend the applicant for reducing the size of the documents. Reduce those. Okay. Would you like to?
like to respond to the comments? I mean, maybe it would be helpful to understand this, what is driving the size of the Falcons okay. and the uh, elevator bulkhead to explore the machine or the elevator. Sure. So um, we did explore the options for the elevator. Uh, we feel that the access to the elevator um, is valuable to the building as an amenity. Um, we have retained um, the elevator consultants DDA. Uh, we have pre presented you with a letter from them explaining the options that we looked at for the elevator, the type of elevator. Um, the issue, quite frankly, is, is that this is it's an existing elevator shaft which cannot be enlarged, which limits our ability to, you know, to consider other solutions uh, for the elevator other than what we proposed herein. Um, so it forces us to have the machine at the, at the, at the roof level. Um, the 19 foot bulkhead, elevator bulkhead, is the minimum height that, uh, that we need to accommodate uh, the machine room above the elevator. Um, regarding the rear balconies, uh, we originally had proposed much larger balconies, uh, which apparently the community board had took issue with. Uh, we reduced them so that it fits within the, the, the nook where the building bottlenecks between the main part of the building and the tail of the building, and so we reduced it to that um, so that we can bring outdoor space to uh, to each of the apartments, which. Is a nice, you know, quality of life um, feature to have. Um, regarding the comment regarding the finishes on the facade, um, as I mentioned before, we, we are going to strip the, the painted brick as well as the painted limestone to restore the original um, care as required once we see what the condition is. Uh, the, the rear of the building also will be stripped. We're not sure if it's, this, it's, it's so corroded that we're not sure the condition of the rear brick, we're not sure the color of the rear brick, we're not even sure if it matches the brick in the front of the building. But our intention is, is to match the existing brick both in the facade as well as the rear of the property. Um, if it's the same brick, terrific. If it's two different bricks, whatever, we'll match it. Any other questions? Okay, so let's uh, have a motion to close the hearing.
large buildings and other very dark incursions, therefore the presence <coughs> of the balconies will not diminish a coherent and <coughs> coherent central green space and that the proposed work will not detract from the special architectural or historic character of the building or streetscape and that the proposed armwork uh, and the second floor of the front facade will match the historic design as seen in a historic drawing. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, Washington, over here by the community. 24 feet in heights, the government's historic as well. A lower style apartment house, and also a minimum of 20. The application is to establish a master plan governing the future installation of the windows. Uh, this was read into the record at the moment of the hearing on October 29th, 2019, but not presented at that time. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Happy Brother and Preservation Staff. This application is for work at 184 Columbia Heights, which is located on the west side of Columbia Heights between our computer front streets and Brooklyn Heights Historic District. Um, the rear of the facade is um, located on the promenade, as you can see here. So in August of this year, the Commission heard a proposal to legalize select windows um, at the rear facade. Uh, which were installed without landmarks preservation commission permits and to establish a master plan uh, for the installation of single light tilted turn windows in the rear of office facades. The commission denied the proposal for the installation of the single light tilted turn windows. However, um, most commissioners were supportive of the establishment of a master plan governing the future installation of windows that feature a different configuration and operation of windows from the historic windows as long as they propose windows that feature more details um, and articulation. So as a response, the applicants have come forward with a new proposal to establish a master plan governing the future installation of single light, tilt and turn windows, and single light and single impaired um, operable awning transoms. So here's the existing elevation, which features several different types of windows. And here's what they're proposing for the rear, which faces the promenade, and then the lot line windows, which can be seen from the promenade. So we'll go back just to give you more context to remind you what the rear facade looked like roughly around the time of the designation of the historic district. So this is a 1976 um, view of the rear facade from the promenade. And here's sort of the, from the 1980s other portions of the rear of this facade. So if you have any questions, the applicant is here to answer them and a member of the board would like to read a statement. Motion to proceed. Second. All in favor? Aye. Please come up and state your name for the record. My name is Catherine Darrow. Um, my husband, Peter Darrow, who's president of the co-op, um, had a statement, which I agree with, but not be here today. I will read the statement if that's okay. <laughs> uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dominic Aresta, who is our building architect. Um, we're here to address a long-standing violation resulting from the installation of single-pane windows on the harbor facing west facade and on the harbor side of our north and south facade more than 35 years ago. No current owner in the building, nor our retired super of 35 years, was aware of this violation until this year. We offer this not as a defense or an excuse, but as an explanation of why we only began to address this recently when your staff brought it to our attention in the context of reviewing the new owner's renovation plan. <clears throat> We've been working for some time with the Brooklyn Heights Association and your staff to develop a window plan to address the violation. This is our second time before you, as I am sure you will hear this evening. Our initial plan proposed full frame picture windows for all the open windows. 
Our theory stems in part from the earliest description of the building in the Earth of Eagle at the time of the building's construction in 1941. And I'll quote that. The site on which the apartment is to be built is unique in many ways and will permit from the rear windows of the building erected thereon an unobstructed view of the New York skyline and the ever-changing shipping scenes of the East New York Woods. And my husband insisted that I would say what he wanted to say, which is, could Walt Whitman have said it better? <laughs> the observation that the selection of windows was all about the outward view and not the appearance of the rear facade was reinforced by the fact that the rear facade never had any architectural <coughs> in contrast to the rich decoration of the front facade. In viewing our first proposal, the Brooklyn Heights Association concurred that, the, that an unobstructed view should be the guiding principle of our window plan, <clears throat> but they objected to the stark look of single pane plate glass. You, the commissioners, agreed, and our proposal was denied. We have since worked with the BHA and your staff to modify the selection of windows to include the transom windows at the top thus preserving the privacy of the view, but breaking the starkness of single panes. This modification has won the approval of the BHA and Community Board too, and is now before you in the form of a revised plan. And now Dominic, our rest of the Good afternoon all, my name is Dominic Resta. I'm here on behalf of JM2 Architecture BC and the board of directors at 184 Pumpy Heights. So um, that was most of the background. So generally what we're proposing are uh, tilt and turret windows with uh, transom windows above. Uh, we think this is preferable rather than reverting back to old style windows uh, for reasons related to building aesthetic, neighborhood character, as well as basic, basic fairness to the existing apartment owners who bought into this uh, view of the harbor. Uh, we're proposing it a uh, uniform look along the uh, rear facade to make all the windows match. Uh, several of the surrounding neighbors have made changes uh, similar to this um, with uh, large painting windows. We're not proposing any new openings. All of the uh, proposed windows are in the existing openings. Uh, we don't think our proposed windows will take away from the architectural char character of the Northern Heights neighborhood. 184 Columbia Heights is has its own um, style, it's never been in a style consistent with that of its neighbors, and this will be true uh, regardless of the windows. And uh, while the front of the building has always been uh, rich in detail and maintains the high set of the standards, the rear of the building is uh, blank and really contains no ornamentation. And uh, the proposed windows are SG500 and SG1200 from Skyline Windows, and um, they are in swing casement windows, which uh, make it easy for cleaning. They have great thermal and acoustical performances. And um, I'll open it up to any questions. Any questions? Just a Judy Stanton. Judy Stanton, speaking for the Fun Heights Association. The BHA supports this proposal. We have previously advocated for a multi-light design and we are pleased to see the applicant return to the commission with this provision. We know that the Fred French building from 1921 was an additional multi-design with view enhancing window openings at the rear facade. Our research found the newspaper articles from this year of construction telling the harbor views of all of us. We also know that the front facade is highly designed and the rear much less so, and it seems they weren't intended to have a relationship. Whatever style the original windows were, they were designed to see out with little or no consideration due to being seen. The problem lot didn't exist when the building was constructed and while some other buildings on Columbia Heights had highly designed west-facing facades, this particular developer chose to leave a plain rear facade. We don't believe the original windows, either on their own or taken as a whole, can be considered to significantly contribute to the scale or articulation of the rear facade. We see no reason to attempt to replicate the original window style, which is definitively, which is not definitively known, nor to match the existing front facade windows because the rear windows in this particular building have always been about new, not style. While we believe that the visibility from the common requires a higher level of scrutiny to any alteration proposal, 
we do not feel it should require a level of design at odds with what exists in Washington. So for this reason, we support the proposal's concept to move to contemporary picture-style windows. We also support a specific design consisting of a three-pane window containing a larger fixed lower section separated by a horizontal volume from two smaller operable upper sections, similar to existing conditions seen on two of the upper floors. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany Thomas. As each of these has supplied an August 6, 2019 for this master plan, this is a highly visible secondary facade of the Brooklyn Heights Brownville. Given the nature of this building situation on a public walking path, HTC evaluated the proposed window master plan as if it was a primary facade. The introduction of transoms as opposed to the previously proposed picture with those is an improvement, but we found that the neighboring building's divided light transoms are quite attractive and it's designed to work well on this facade. Bringing up more of the large class openings is another appropriate treatment for both sides building in our city's first historic district. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else would like to speak on this application? We have a resolution from uh, the community board to recommend the approval of the application. Uh, do we have any final questions before we move into discussion? Let's have a motion to close the hearing. So we can check that in the fall and day. So, you know, the last time we disapproved the uh, request for legalizing the place in the district single family was at that time said that they did not need to uh, go back to a historic configuration but needed to provide a proposal that had provided some level of articulation and detail. And I think this is responsive. Okay, great. Do you want to agree with Number one. Number two. In the matter of FPC. Dash twenty oh two five two five one eighty four Columbia High School, Brooklyn Heights Historic District. Uh, application is to establish a master plan governing the future installation of windows. I note that the building style, scale, material, and detail are one of the features that contribute to the special architectural and historical character of the Brooklyn Light Historic District. Still further notes that the rear of the building faces the Brooklyn Light Promenade, a highly traffic pedestrian thoroughfare, and that the many windows have been replaced over time without landmark preservation commission permit. I recommend, uh, I note that most of the windows at the rear facade have been replaced by the time of the designation of the historic district. Therefore, the replacement of windows will not eliminate any significant needs. Or I recommend, I recommend the approval finding that most of the windows at the rear facade have been replaced by, replaced by the time of the designation of the historic district. Therefore, the replacement of windows will not eliminate any significant historical features of the building. That most documentation indicates that the view from the rear windows of the building featuring unobstructed views of New York Skyline and the East, East and North Rivers <coughs> is a defining feature of the building. Therefore the, therefore, the installation of windows with large amount of glass featuring single white panes and transoms will be kept with the historic designation and character of That the real facade is not seen in conjunction with the designed primary facade. Therefore, the, the change in configuration of the proposed windows will not detract from any significant feature of the building. That the scale and articulation of the windows will be harmonious with residential scale and character of the building's square facade. That the proposed black finish will match the finish of the historic windows, and that over time, full implementation of the proposed window master plan will be will have to preserve the special architectural character of the building and the revived building's presentation path. Second. All in favor? 
be opposed. And so that's approved. Thank you very much. We're going to have a break for lunch. Um, and it's about 12 o'clock. We'll come back at 1 o'clock. <laughs>
without further comment that LPC approved the application. Would you like to address some of the comments that were made about the finishes, the stucco and metal finishes on the addition and how it relates to the context?
and then 218 here, excavated, terraced and excavated, and then 216 as well. The, uh, the proposed shows a much larger terrace rear yard at 218, um, and the following slides will show more detail. Um, this is, uh, we pulled some contours from an old map just uh, to show that the slope is towards the north, uh, which flows into the building, and to the west, which flows into the neighbors. Um, it's just sort of the zoom in from that, that previous block plan. Um, side by side, we have the previously approved um, at staff level excavated rear yard at 15 foot 6 uh, and a 13 foot terraced rear yard, um, leaving at that time over 60 feet. Um, the proposed uh, extends the excavated patio and terrace uh, to a, a 43 foot untouched rear yard. Um, showing a few contour lines on this plan as well. And where previously drainage was, was proposed, uh, and now uh, expanded terracing and drainage uh, further back in the yard. This is a section cut through the previously approved. Um, the, red, the dashed red line shows the uh, as well, approximately the, uh, the original conditions where the, uh, the rear yard had flowed into an excavated terrace. Um, really bad drainage issues causing near collapse of the original T-porch that was approved uh, for rebuilding the staff level. And then the proposed, uh, showing much more of the kerosene, negotiating that slope uh, to improve drainage on this site and also uh, potential overflow uh, to the neighbor at 216. Um, I should note that the owner is also here uh, just to talk about some uh, of the, the neighbor has uh, issued a letter that also supports our, our proposal and drainage issues have been resolved with what has been done. Um, and then an axonometric is most telling, showing um, the previously and proposed um, 216 neighbor, which has a terrace uh, rear yard uh, covered partly in blue stone and brick, back to a line um, that you see now. This terrace <coughs> 218 is attempting to sort of mitigate and, and sort of level up to, uh, as well as what's going on at 220 that had been uh, approved at the public hearing <coughs> by the commissioners. Um, the note that this has already been done, the, the owner and contractor, along with the structural engineer uh, gave, giving details of the retaining wall, did this preemptively uh, in May, June. So we've been uh, on the, in the process of getting to everyone here since that point, that point in time. Um, but that shows you uh, what's, what's been done. Um, the, the areas will have landscaping that have, and stucco walls, uh, concrete walls. There's uh, a little bit of the drainage that's now hooked up, uh, drainage back in here. Um, the, the, the rear area has been filled in with a, a permeable um, a mixture of, of uh, gravel and, and, and earth to in order to pick up uh, some of the uh, rainwater and then drain down through the, uh, the storm water system in the building. And just trying to show a little bit of the neighbor without too much peekabooing, but you do see there um, the brick and bluestone uh, neighbor as well. And then looking back to uh, the building from the original condition overgrown to the new terrace situation. Thank you. Any questions? We do have a letter from the Prospect Heights Neighborhood Development Council supporting the application and a resolution from Brooklyn Community Board 8 also supporting the application. <coughs> so the, under the rules, the staff is authorized to approve a certain amount of excavation to certain debt. Uh, and that's what has been approved here along with the construction procedure. And during excavation, Realize there were drainage issues that needed to be addressed and developed a terrace uh, situation that would address those drainage issues and getting a little ahead of ourselves. Uh, the remaining portion that's at the original grade is still 43 feet long. These are unusually deep parts. Um, and the neighbor is a cave of this piece of cave just secured the last terrace before we're going to make it. 
So it seems like there's a variety of conditions within the school that's created that. Yeah. But there's sort of two separate issues here. One is whether this is the right solution which we can talk about. But it's just, it just seems bizarre to me here. It took, probably took longer to come up with the new solution than it would have been taken to call our staff when they discovered they needed to change the plan. So I guess I'm just disturbed about you know, we're sitting here with a job to do, and, and you know it here, but you, nobody comes to us. How do you explain that? So I guess in May or June, we mm -hmm. discovered. So did you reach out to us right away? Or? Yeah, we, had, we started through uh, the so. Right, I think the, the first uh, email went out around May 30th that we started, we reached out to the Pickens Quays Park and then through staff level to get us here. That point. I fully understand what you're saying. This is definitely um, but as I as soon as I came in, as soon as I was called, my attention to it. I wasn't there previously when it was decided. I, we came here. That's uh, there is a period of you consulting with the Yeah, I'm going to tell you. Uh, there is a period of uh, consulting with staff about to what exactly uh, will meet staff rules or doesn't. And, what the issues are that need to go to public hearing and the process of going to the community board and, and uh, you know, filing deadlines for here. And so it can, if going to get into a public hearing, can't take it over. Uh, it is Uh, 
application is to construct a riptide addition. Again, this is read into the record. Uh, the hearing on October 29th, 2019, was not presented. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, Commissioners, Richard Lyon, Preservation Staff. Uh, the building is located on the west side of Underhill Avenue in Prospect Heights Historic District and Boundary near uh, the junction with Prospect Heights. Um, also, it is located opposite uh, the New York City uh, owned uh, Underhill Playground, which is just outside the boundary. Uh, the application is to construct a gray painted metal clad. Uh, Sloping stair bulkhead, metal railings, and rooftop HVAC equipment at the western half of the uh, roof adjacent to the rear facade. This the sections. Uh, just to show you the context of uh, the playground. Um, because of the why we're here for a public hearing is because the property um, located across from Underhill Playground, uh, the rooftop additions are more visible uh, than can be approved with staff most of the mock-ups. Uh, through the ratings uh, of the place uh, into the playground and from the raised playground itself. Let's see. Um, and otherwise, uh, from Prospect Place, um, uh, the uh, sort of moot standard is invisible. Um, the, uh, there is within the row an existing stair bulkhead addition, which was erected uh, prior to the designation of the historic infrastructure. Um, the uh, Aaron Schreier, former Schreier Architects, is here to answer any questions. Thank you. Would you like to? Say anything? Does it slope towards the park? The playground? Slope towards the front? Yes. It slopes towards the other uh, rear. The park will be inside. Good. So the slope is facing. Okay. Any other questions? Patty Gagan. The Prospect Heights Neighborhood Development Council, PHNTC, hereby presents comments about the Certificate of Appropriateness of Application for 130 Underhill Avenue, the Roanesque Revival, Renaissance Revival style row house designed by William H. Reynolds and built circa 1898. The applicants are proposing the addition of a rooftop deck stair bulkhead, and AC equipment on the roof. These additions will be visible from several locations on Park Place and Prospect Place within the historic district. The applicants have agreed that they will reduce the visual impact of the bulkhead by painting its size the same charcoal gray that is specified for the standing seam roof rather than white as originally specified. They have also clarified that the railing surrounding the deck at the rear rooftop is a simple black painted metal. With these provisions, PHNDC supports this application. Thank you for the opportunity to submit these comments. Sincerely, Robert Witherwax, um, he's the chairman of the Prospect Heights Neighborhood Development. Thank you, thank you, and I am just reminded that this is one of the items that was read into the record on October 29th, so I need to make a motion. And to open. here are some fall leaves for you guys to have from the streets of Prospect Heights okay. Historic right. District. And before uh, anyone else says another word, let's make a motion to open the proceedings. So, okay. Okay. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this application? <laughs> So uh, we do have a resolution from Community Board 8 um, recommending approval and acknowledging the changes that were agreed to that were just by the Prospect Council. Yeah. Do you want to add anything? Okay, I'll make a motion to approve the resolution. 
because largely because there's playgrounds, more than um, the definition of the that is a little bit under our rules that are authorized the staff to approve it. Um, and this is, I think, the point of most visibility, which as I understand the drawings, is that we're to see this slowly. I think it'll be this very typical for the kind of, uh, seems like they'll address the concerns when they just hang about how much they get really comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, great. So, Michael? Regarding 139 of the last of Texas Drug District, the application is to construct the routine position. I know that all these scales, uh, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic factor of the Preston Heights Historic District have a matter of an approval plan and construction of the proposal to stop bulkhead will not alter damage or destroy any significant architectural features if the bulkhead HBAC units and railing will be visible directly over the front side of the house. In limited views, it is significant based on an elevated playground directly in front of the property. The bulkhead will be moderate in size and set back in front of the facade, thereby not allowing the house. That is how we maintain a sense of its visual mass and propose standing seam metal pipe bulkhead. And metal railing are simply designed and typical of return in terms of material and finish, helping them remain a secular presence on the vertical on the track, the building, or the prospect heights of the district. So, while there, any opposed? For the last public meeting item before we switch over to the preservation on the hearing items is item number nine. This is LPC 19 29526 an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the Queen's Block 8042 out 58. Each short road in the Southwest and Historic District, under the Rival Style Freestanding House built in the 1950s. The application is to construct an addition and modify the driveway and curb cut. This was uh, last presented at the public hearing on March 12, 2019. No action was taken. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Michelle Perrin, Preservation Staff. This application is for work at 8 Shore Road, which is located on the northwest corner of Shore Road and West Drive in the Northeastern Historic District. I would like to note that this is not one of the buildings for which the Historic District is designated and was last presented at the public hearing on March 12, 2019. The proposal at that time was to demolish an existing breezeway and garage, construct a two story addition, as well as modify the driveway and curb. Uh, for a bit of context, this slide shows the existing conditions of the house which was constructed in the 1950s. The front facade of the main building faces Shore Road over here, um, while the side facade where the addition is proposed faces West Drive. And this slide shows the proposed addition laid over aerial imagery to give you an idea of the existing or the proposed size. And this slide shows examples of other additions within the Douglas and Historic Districts. Um, at the hearing in March, commissioners present, uh, present, the present um, had a consensus of support for an addition of this house. However, concern was expressed about the relationship of the addition, um, its proposed roof lines to those of the main house, as well as the new garage. Commissioners present also suggested that the applicants study the use of gable roofs and different fenestration that would better relate to the main house and the historic district. So this is the um, addition as it was proposed. Um, in this slide, you can see these two these two photo montages that is previously proposed, and this is what um, the architect is now proposing. Um, so this photo montage shows the proposed addition will only be minimally visible when viewed from Shore Road. It's a tiny portion of the roof. <coughs> And it will not be visible over the primary facade of the house on Shore Road. This is the current condition of the house when seen from West Drive. You can see the breezeway in the rock existing garage. Um, these elevation drawings show the proposal as presented on March 12th on the top and the revised proposal below. The applicant has revised the design by changing the main roof of both the second story of the addition and the garage to gables instead of hip roofs. A shed door provides the headroom previously achieved by the full height second story, and paired double hung windows echo original window configurations at the main house. The garage door and windows will also be wood. Um, and in the, as in the previous proposal, the addition will be clad in cedar shaped with an asphalt roof, continuing those materials from the main house. Note that the configuration of the paired windows of the first floor of the addition seen here is inaccurate. It will, in fact, um, match the others shown there. It's just a rendering issue. 
Um, additionally, the applicant is proposing to demolish two dormers at the rear of the house um, and add a shepherd dormer, um, as well as a boreal bay right here um, between the rear of the house and the addition to provide additional head height through this corner. Neither of these elements will be visible from public. And this is the, the view uh, from of the west facade. Um, due to the slope of West Drive, only a small portion of the roof of the addition is seen from any public vantage point. And this slide shows the proposed north facing facade of the addition with that Oriole window here and the shed former replacing these two dormers. Um, and due to the height of the addition, there will be no change in the view from the front facade. Um, there are additional slides showing details of the existing house floor plan and window details to provide any clarifications the commissioners may have. Um, the applicant is also here if you have any questions. Any questions? And we have um, not received any news on this on this particular proposal. But the last time we saw it, I think we had concerns about the um, overall height, but mostly the roof lines and the language of the addition
and a black metal overhang. This work will be partially visible um, from the South Lounge of Street. The applicant is here to answer any questions. I think this question is for you. Um, the, while they're at it, are they replacing all of the non-matching brick on the facade? No, they are not. Well, let's see. It's all around the areas that they're doing their work. So I guess they are, because they are raising this right here, and they're going to be um, extending this vertically and horizontally. Do you want to add anything to this? Is really your general approach? Or? All right, I'm Michael Dewey from Back Stingway Architects. So, um, uh, just to talk about a little bit more, the, the shape of the bulkhead itself was shaped specifically so you couldn't see it, either from the Grace Court Alley or all the way down at the street level where Hicks is. Um, there was really not much we could do about seeing it from drama. You could see it over a number of trees and other items. And once it zoomed in, it's kind of ready to focus on. There's also a very large addition to the right of us. Uh, not very large, but larger than ours. Um, uh, in terms of just answering the, the front facade question a little bit more, so uh, we are better or worse have had a lot of experience with those specific bricks. So we will replace them. Uh, we will replace them with some of the existing bricks. You know, we can find them within that facade. Um, the bricks that are there that are replaced actually are the right size and have the right um, uh, 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 lines and so forth, uh, which are better than the ones that we can find right now. So it depends on what we can find. And it's better than what they did when they replaced us. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, it would be great to get rid of it. It's got a glazing, I think, just kind of goes wrong. Um, but we've uh, unsuccessfully tried to solve that before. And whoever did found bricks that were the right size. And so we'll see. Uh, it's a passive house, and the front windows are also a uh, simulated double line as well. Any other questions? Okay, is there anyone who'd like to speak on this application? Yes. Do you stand for speaking with the Brooklyn Heights Association? The Brooklyn Heights Association Landmarks Committee has reviewed this proposal and we support it. We suggest that the project team continue to pay attention to the garage door design once construction starts in case on-site changes are necessary. It appears that design provides very little room for variation in the trim and detail work between the upper wall and the fixed portions of the garage doors and between the panels within the fixed portion. If you have conditions for that building to see this appearance shown in the design, we would expect the team to work with staff on an appropriate alternative. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? We have a resolution from the community board two, um, holding the opinion that the front door should be a solid panel door rather than glazed, and otherwise recommends approval of the application. Any further questions? Okay, let's have a motion to close the hearing. Second. All in favor? Okay. So we've seen, of course, many uh, adapted and also we continue residential uses for characterizes in this district and others. Um, and I think that Grace Point Island has a very special character because you know, just eliminating any visibility or it seems like the right strategy or the bad issues of other issues. Given the fact that the garage door has historically earlier already been divided into the approaching demonstration, Carriage house, the application is construct rooftop and rear addition to raise the roof, replace windows and doors, modify this and rear openings. I know the building's scale, the materials and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Brooklyn Heights Historic District. I recommend approval on the 
that the proposed work will not eliminate or damage any significant architectural features. That the enlargement in width of the central opening at the second floor will return this element closer to its historic appearance. That the configuration materials and details of the wood, multi lights, and related double hung windows at the second floor will recall windows historically counted buildings of this type, style, and age within the historic district. That the raising of the lintel height of the garage opening at the first floor will be in keeping with very history of alterations to the openings at the building space. That the proposed doors of the building space will be in keeping with entrances typically found in buildings of this type, style, and age in terms of material finish and will harmonize the upper floors of the building. That the proposed rooftop addition will be set back from the front and rear facades, thereby helping to maintain a sense of the building's original mastic. That the proposed rooftop addition and raised roof will not be visible over the front of Grace Court Alley facade and will only be visible over the rear south facade from the gap in the street while on trial on the street will be seen in the context of other rooftop accretions. That the materials and design of the rooftop, rooftop addition, including standing seam metal plans and simple window and door assemblies, are in keeping with rooftop accretions of buildings of this type, age, and style and will not draw undue attention to it itself. But only the upper portion of the proposed projecting bay combined masonry opening on the first floor of the rear facade will be visible from the south at a distance and will be partially screened by a wall. The proposed one story projecting bay and back black finish metal overhang will not extend to the rear lot line or overlanding building. That the outer brick piers will be retained and the infant will feature regular pattern of vertical mullions, helping to maintain the residential scale. And that the work will have to track the building work for the next The next item is number three, LPC 19 3970, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the road and Adam Fox, and 31 by 43. One West 29th Street, all the way to church and individual landmark. Roman Escort Bible Sound Church with God, the Bible Sound Details, designed by Sam Warner. The application is to install signage. Thank you. 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 really makes a difference in being able to reach out. The second thing that I hope to come through is we know we're an historic landmark. Marble has high standards for decor. And so 
if the sign is approved, will ensure that it's appropriate for who we are and where we are as a historic landmark. So again, thank you for your consideration. We're greatly really appreciative of that. So just to run through our slides very quickly. Uh, probably the church was built in 1854 by a design by Samuel Warren. Uh, the uh, sketch in the middle shows the church as it existed. The photo on the right shows the city growing up around it. And the photo on the left uh, from 1959 shows the signs in place. Uh, we've uh, done our research and as far as we can tell the sign did not exist by 1940. We think it came in at the beginning of World War II. Just have some context and overview, uh, and then looking at the church head on uh, with the sign on the left at the corner of 29 and 5th. And uh, here, looking closely at the sign, I saw one of the elements. We have the pediment at the top uh, with the name Marble Creek Church. Uh, we have the information area. Uh, all of this is made out of wood, painted uh, to look like bronze. Uh, it is supported by uh, steel. Uh, which is painted black, and uh, you can see the photos at the bottom, uh, which are not the most connected in the world, and people are making that better with the new sign. Uh, I also want to say that this is the only sign that Marble Church the Church has, so uh, it's a very, very important sign. Uh, here you see the proposed sign. Uh, it's uh, very similar in shape. It has the pediment, it has quarter inch bronze letters, uh, for the name of the church, uh, and it has a digital screen to provide the information. Uh, it is black uh, uh, coated uh, supports uh, the structural steel inside, and as you can see in the uh, rendering, actually will have the coatings buried below the papers. And here you see the plans, uh, the side plan on the left, again showing the location of the sign in the corner. Uh, and a large branch on the end of the location <coughs> And here you're looking at the elevation, uh, head on on the left, and uh, from 29 streets you can see the sign and the silhouette. <coughs> and then just three views uh, the center, and then on the left you get the sign on the front, and on the right you get the rear uh, and the sign. And these are the kinds of images. Uh, that, uh, that Michael pointed out uh, will be appropriate uh, to the kind of information the church is going to be providing. Uh, the sign on the upper right is probably most typical, uh, and that's information without illustrations. Uh, the other two signs on the left show what might happen with illustrations, and the sign on the lower right, which you've already seen, shows how to the screen uh, can be subdivided. Of course, the point here is that we can do this almost instantaneously instead of having to get up on a ladder, open a door, which can be actually dangerous if you get a bus custom wind or something, uh, and then taking all that time to remove letters, put them back, and so on and so on. So uh, having a sign like this is really quite important. Also, uh, the sign is illuminated, but it will be muted at night, so there will be much less intensity at night. The intent of the church is to be a good neighbor and not to have this sign be anything other than informational and appropriate in its look. Uh, we also have the technical drawings uh, from one time about the signs being built. And again, uh, sort of describe the pieces of it, and I think that's fairly uh, straightforward here. Um, this is sort of the innards of the sign, and uh, what's happening on the right is the conduit is going up the leg. It's going to an electric box again below the papers, and that electric box is fed from <coughs> the interior of the church. Uh, <coughs> the back of the sign is actually very important. It's the only piece that is not true bronze, that is a perforated metal uh, coated uh, to look like bronze. Perforation is critical for ventilation. Uh, and there is also a ventilation slot around the frame in the front. And uh, we are going to be discreetly lighting the name of the church, uh, and that's going to be done with an LED, and that's sort of a blow up of that tiny little uh, detail that uh, will illuminate the uh, name of the church. And uh, here 
here is a comparison uh, of the existing and the proposed. And you can see that they are similar in size, similar in design. Uh, the major difference is that the proportioning of the information area has to relate to the, design, to the size of the digital screen rather than uh, being what we might uh, just provide if we were trying to do it uh, as was originally done uh, in a more uh, traditional way. And lastly, uh, here are some precedents uh, on the left of uh, the church, Middle Collegiate Church on 7th Street and 2nd Avenue, uh, and then um, uh, Loyola um, on 84th and Park. And you'll note that they actually have two digital signs, uh, and then uh, set the sign on and put the third thing as you can. So um, this was to give you an overview of what we want to do, and we hope you will find it appropriate. Thank you. Okay. The images are static, even the images. Images will all be static. I, I thought Michael had said that, or I thought Dr. James had said that. Yes, images will all be static. No videos? No. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Madam Chair and members of the Landmark Preservation Commission. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I am Carolyn Thornton. My husband will be speaking in a moment. And we are actually neighbors of Marvel Community. We moved here from San Antonio eight years ago and we live on 32nd and 6th. And our first church to visit after we moved to the city was Marble Collegiate Church, which was just a mere few blocks away. And we never left because it is a very warm and welcoming church. And more than that, it has a very much community outreach, very involved in many aspects of the community. Um, for the past eight years since we've been here, We've seen the ministries increase year by year. And it's so important, I think, to get to the, the message to the people that live around the church that there's more going on. We have the beautiful fence with the ribbons commemorating, well, different things at different, different times of the year. But when a person walking by, we see many of them stop. They stand and look at the ribbons but the board now does not give enough information for them to know all the vibrant things that are going on in our congregation. So we strongly support a new sign, a tasteful sign, and uh, that will give more information about our outreach. Um, the sign, we believe, is a way we can continue to inform the public of the growing number of events and ways that our neighbors can participate in activities associated with the church. And ours is a burgeoning neighborhood. Um, so we hope that you will decide in favor of our request. And thank you for being heard. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me, William E. Thornton. <coughs> Members of the Landmark Preservation Commission, my name is Bill Thornton. For the past eight years, as Carol and my wife said, we've lived at 885 6th Avenue, just a few blocks from Marble, and we are members of Marble. I thank you for the opportunity to speak today in support of Marble's application before you, and I'm here to urge the Commission to vote in favor of this application. Having served as Mayor of San Antonio, Texas, I appreciate your service and your dedication to maintaining responsibility for protecting it. New York City's architecturally, historically, and culturally significant buildings, of which I can certainly understand why Marble is one of those. As you've heard, Marble Collegiate Church was founded in 1628 and is one of the oldest continuous Protestant congregations in North America. In this same manner in San Antonio, we were tasked to protect the Alamo located in our city center, commercial development all around it. And even today, there is an intense uh, fight would be the word I would say, going on of how do you preserve, yet how do you present history when there are commercial buildings that have also been there for 150 years. Whose right has the most? The article in today's paper was the Woolworth Counter, which is one of the stores they want to turn into a museum to show, present the history. So preservation of history gets difficult when everything in the past is history. How do you do it respectfully and in a way that fits within the community? And that's what Marvel is trying to do with this sign. When my wife and I, as you just heard, moved here eight years ago, our choice of where to worship was obvious. The mission-driven programs of Marvel combined with its significant programming from music to family to individual outreach made our decision very easily. Marvel has a sustained, focused desire to serve its neighborhood. The broad array of programming focused on children to families to the arts extends from Marble throughout our entire city. Marble also has ministries focused on our neighborhood, which include, but are not limited to, meals for the homeless in Madison Square Park, backpacks for school supplies, with school supplies for children in need, sustained tutoring at Public School 20 in East Harlem, food drives to get pantry foods to those in need. The application before you represents how our church wishes to continue the strong mission to the congregants, the community at large, and the people in our neighborhood. The sign is a respectful way for our church's leadership to further inform the community about important events that are made available and can increase participation to greater numbers 
of participating, those participating now around our church. It is my hope that the commission will support this application and thank you for letting us make our presentation. Thank you. Kelly <coughs> Carroll. Kelly Carroll, Historic Districts Council. HTC has concerns regarding internally illuminated digital sites calling too much attention to themselves and subsequently detracting from historic environments that they are installed in. The proposed signage would not be completely objectionable so as long as the graphics are austere and the illumination is conservative. However, we feel that this proposal reflects a broader issue regarding the appropriateness of digital screens in designated historic districts that requires further thoughtful study by the Commission. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this application? Okay. We have a resolution from uh, Community Board 5 uh, recommending denial of the application. Is there anything you'd like to say before we move into our discussion? Like to be yeah. I think maybe just Valerie uh, Campbell from Grammar 11, representative. One thing I did want to note is that we did make some changes to the presentation after the community board presentation, and that included actually um, submitting the guidelines as to how the display um, would be monitored, and how it, what would be allowed. And these guidelines are very consistent with the guidelines. Um, that have been adopted for other approved signs for religious institutions. Right. Yeah, it seems that they have some comments about the full motion color video screen. And um, can you say something about removing historic patterns of this earlier sign? Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, it's clear that we're removing the old sign. <laughs> Are there any more questions? Maybe. Maybe. It's clear that we're moving the old sign. We're trying to uh, replace it with a sign that is similar in its appearance, proportions, and general overall look. The old sign simply doesn't do what's required for the church in today's information uh, mode. Okay, thank you. So can we have a motion to close the hearing? Second. All in favor? So, I, that's the sound is fine, perfectly appropriate. I think the limitations they put on are terrific. I, I hope they don't follow testimony and only use austere graphics. It's probably not going to be very attractive. Uh, but I might think it's perfectly appropriate. Um, I thought, um, well, what I'm going to say, I guess, is that uh, it is so well said by the by the presentation, but also by the uh, testimony that we've heard. Uh, churches and uh, all sorts of houses of worship in, in the city today are so full of activities uh, that uh, need to somehow express themselves on the outside. Uh, maybe quite like a retailer would, but not completely opposite a retailing need either. Um, so we've done this before. We're not the first. Uh, I think we will be doing it much more often. I think this is a way for these houses of worship to stay relevant and to stay uh, thriving with all of this activity that they do. Um, so I'm completely in favor of it. I think that they have the replication size, style, and everything is just terrific. And the, the, what we're going to see on it is going to be well regulated. I also want to just say you never know what's going to happen here in, a, in a, just another application. But I'm a, a seventh generation Texan, born in Galveston, raised in Houston, and to have a former mayor of San Antonio come up and, and, uh, and speak to us was so for, for this guy. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so I think, yeah, thank you. this is completely appropriate, as you said, we've done it before, its size and scale as a part of the and the LED signage. In the matter of LPC-19, 
29799, 1 West 29th Street, Marble Kennedy Church, Louisville, Atlanta. Application to install signage. I recommend, I recommend approval. I note that the work will not damage or remove any significant architectural feature in the building of something that the site will replace an existing site, similar size and the same location, and the presence of a site of this size within the area will not change information, will not, will change information in the keeping the traditional sign typically found at religious buildings. But the sign features any new technology to obtain probable information, content, a modern version of traditional freestanding directories associated with religious buildings, that the programming will be limited to static images and a limited color palette, and that the work will not detract from the specific architectural and historical character of the land. All in favor? Aye. Okay, that's approved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for all you. Can I just say, hey, I'm excited. I'm real. I'm from the C-19 and I'm going to be advised that the application for the certificate is fine. You know, the Amazon was actually for a certificate. Five eight, four, five, six, seven, cast iron, it's a commercial building design by the building. It's very interesting. It's a very interesting. It's a very interesting. It's a very interesting. It's a very interesting. Thank you for your work. Good afternoon, Commissioners Elizabeth Bacon, Preservation Staff. This item is 584 Broadway, located on the east side of Broadway between Prince and Houston Streets in the Soho Cast Iron Historic District. The application is to install a flagpole and banner sign between the two center storefronts at the Broadway facade. The commissioners will note that 584 Broadway shares a facade with the adjacent building to the south, and that the flagpole at 580 Broadway, which you can see here, was approved by the commission in 1987. Here on the left at the bottom, you can see images of the existing storefront, and in the image on the top right, you'll see examples of other commission-approved flagpoles in the district. The proposal also involves removing the existing staff-approved bracket sign you can see here upon the installation of the flagpole. The proposed flagpole will be installed in an area of flat limestone, approximately 19 feet above the sidewalk. The armature will project four feet from the facade, and the canvas banner sign measures three feet wide by six feet four inches tall, and the lower portion of the banner sign will be approximately 12 feet six inches above the sidewalk. And the applicants are here and available to answer any questions. Do you have any questions for Dan? Is the sign at the same level as the existing? Um, no, it's about a foot or so higher, um, but the proposed sign is just at the top of the storefront opening, and the existing you can see is a little bit lower than the storefront opening. I think that's the front of the sign that's sort of next to it down the street there. Oh, this flat pole, sorry. What's our, what's our standard there? Um, I, the, that flat pole was approved by the commission in 1987. Um, I'm not sure of the dimensions of the flag or the armature, though. Typically, um, partly because of zoning, but also partly because of uh, sort of traditional location, <coughs> the commission has a group of flag poles at the second floor, sort of typically windows sills or in areas of plain masonry uh, at that second floor level. And um, so this is a little bit different in that it's a flag pole with a, albeit a small banner at the top of the first floor. Um, a separate building, but from matching building. Where we were through the same floor. So I guess the, the, the relationship between the two is some kind of a And sorry, in the, in the 187 was in the historic spot, was there a flagpole there previously? Yes. 
Um, I know that the findings for that permit mentioned there were existing um, holes in the facade that they so, were using. So I'm wondering, are located, this location now, are there, is there an extension plate or uh, holes or anything that we know? Um, that you not at the second floor. No. Not aware. But it would be symmetrical. Yeah, you would think it would be there. I'm interested to know how the two banners are size. And we just have um, an additional comment from the applicants as well. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Rob, and I'm representing Gun Science. Uh, first, we're trying to get in contact with the landlord to see if they can allow us to put this uh, second floor. And he's not interested in having to have this second floor. So, for some reason, it's up to him. And we try to uh, to get this proposed, uh, mm -hmm. and that would be up to you. And your banner is six feet long. Yeah, it's not that long. Do you have any idea how long the banner is? It should be more than eight, between eight and ten feet. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
one, which is the one that we turned over, that would be consistent with reason. Yes. So in terms of the banner itself, it's kind of the length of the pole dictates the proportion, uh, but it's certainly a six to eight tank foot pole that has been approved by the commission. Um, but Sarah, when we have approved banners, which we have a lot of on the commission, is the amount of banners normally associated with getting on the building as opposed to the retail? Not necessarily. <laughs> Broadway and several cast iron historic district application has to install five pole and banner. I know that building scale, style, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the several cast iron historic district. I recommend approval with a modification. Finding that the proposed work will not eliminate or damage any significant architectural features. The use of five pole and banner for commercial and private purposes is consistent with the commercial and industrial character of the streetscape and historic district that the large scale of this commercial building can support the presence of a flagpole, that the previously approved bracket sign will be removed upon installation of the flagpole and banner, thereby reducing the overall amount of signage of the building, and that the installation will not attract the special historic and architectural character of the building and historic district. However, I find that the location of the flagpole is not in keeping with the location of the flagpole installations within the district, which are typically located at the second floor or above, including the existing commission approved flagpole installed at the adjacent sister property at 580 Broadway. Therefore, I recommend that the flagpole be installed on the second floor and the size of the flag be no larger than the one in 580 Broadway and be proportionate with the size of the flagpole. Second, I'll bear. All right. Any other The next five items are going to be right, uh, right in and presented together. It's headings five through nine. Uh, LPC 20-01959, 20-03937, 20-03938, 20-04935, 20-04938, 20-04938, 20-04938, 20-04938, 20-04938, 20-04938, 20-04938, 20-04938, 20-04938, 20-04938, 20-04938, 20-04938, 20-04938
I have a lot of ready to explain anything in, in addition. Sure. Um, so um, my name is Chad Smith. I'm with the Smith and Architects. And, um, and uh, this, uh, this uh, essentially the presentation you, you, uh, you have seen before. We did have a, a, you know, one of these existing uh, doors and, and transoms that, the, uh, that uh, came with the building when the building owner purchased them. Um, earlier this year, we uh, presented um, uh, the project at 200, uh, which included around the corner on Amsterdam Avenue, the replacement of that uh, one story kind of infill structure with a new structure as a package room with a lot of ornamental you know, iron pipe work. Um, and then a corresponding front door with a new transom, a metal plate. Um, and these uh, these uh, decorative uh, sculptural fine like uh, uh, door handles. So our proposal is to basically complete the set. Uh, we have uh, all these other doors with all these other uh, non uh, non uh, uh, not not approved doors, uh, heavy doors over there, and we're uh, you know we're placing it. Uh, it's exactly like this door. Um, the other thing that does change is that some of the doors, uh, because of uh, kind of the interior of the, the lobby and some of these, uh, the, the handing of the door uh, is here. So 200, uh, you can see 200, uh, the door hinges on the right. On 202, 206, 208, it hinges on the left, but otherwise it does. Um, this matches the existing handling on the existing doors. Um, when you open these doors, there's more space on one side or more space on the other side. Depending on the property we're talking about. Otherwise, the finishes are exactly the same. The lights are exactly the, 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 the shade light we're putting on the other doors is exactly the same. Uh, and the finishes, everything's the same. Any questions? Good afternoon, Commissioners. Will Edwards for Landmark West. Landmark West Certificate of Appropriateness Committee supported the same applicant in May when they first introduced the Broadway Veil. As this is a continuation of the same design, we are hard pressed to challenge what we already are in support. Although we should caution prior to approval, is not assurance, prior approval is not assurance that our committee will adhere to this precedent in the future. The new vocabulary of signage, door infill, and hardware will complement the existing intervention in a more united front for the row while updating the appearance of each threshold and the security of those who dwell within. Further, there are, they are a specific replacement of a pedestrian series of fixtures of intensively poor quality design. Everyone knows. Landmark West Certificate of, Appropri of Appropriateness Committee supports the C of A application for approval. Thank you. Does anyone else would like to speak on this application? Okay, we do have a resolution from Community Board 7 recommending approval. Of the <laughs> Any final questions for the applicant? We should close the hearing. Second. All in favor? Okay, discussion. So we approve this approach on the corner building. Well, we're hard to to disagree with ourselves. <laughs> so, you know, the corner building is slightly taller, and so we could distinguish it, but I think it's just, you know, the doors are going to be screwed, and then some guys are not going to be so sure. Now, are we reading each one? No, we're going to do one with all of the other. So all well, you know, the docket numbers and the uh, spread of the same address and then the yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so LPC two zero zero one nine five nine, LPC two zero zero uh, three nine three seven, LPC two zero zero three nine three eight. LPC 2003939 and LPC 2003940. Um, 
two, these are all on West 83rd Street, the upper west side of Central Park West Historic District. Can I say it that way? Or is that 202 to 210. To 210, I'm sorry. 202 to 210, West 83rd Street, upper west side, Central Park West Historic District. Uh, this is a neo Greg style apartment building designed by Tom and Wilson and built in 1880 to 81. And the application is to install entrance infill. I know the building style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Upper West Side, Central Park West Historic District, and I recommend approval finding that the proposed roof will not damage, obscure, or replace any significant architectural or historic features, that the doors and transom window will fit neatly within the existing opening, that the thin metal frame entry door will narrow, that the side lines will recall historic iron doors found at buildings of this age and type, the proposed, proposed work will not detract from the special architectural or historic character of the building or the Upper West Side Central Park West Historic District. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Any opposed? That's approved. Next item is number 10, LPC 19 4019, an application for a certificate of appropriate to the road path. Block 1887 on 50. 771 Western Avenue, the Riverside West Side Historic District Extension 2. The rest line for Bogle Style Apartment Building designed by Schwartz and Gross and built in 1914 to 15. The application is to establish a master plan governing the future installation of the house. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Holly Hughes, Preservation Staff. This item is 771 West End Avenue, located between West 96th Street and West 97th Street in the Riverside West End Historic District Extension 2. The proposal before you today is to establish a master plan governing the future installation of windows. Historically, this building had various configurations of multi-light windows at all facades. The master plan proposed is for window replacement at the 1st through 12th floors at the West End Avenue, West 96th Street, and West 97th Street facades, and the entrance courtyard facades. You will note that in 2017, the commission approved the installation of one over one windows at the 12th floor. The proposal features various configurations of one over one, double hung aluminum windows, with profiled aluminum brick molds and mullions and a bronze finish. These are the proposed elevations with one over one double hung windows. And then these are the existing condition photos, including a photo of the only remaining multi light window, uh, which they are located in the stairwell. The commission will note that all existing one over one windows were installed before designation, with the exception of the one over one windows at the 12th floor, which were approved by the commission in 2017. The applicants are here if you have any questions. Madam Chair, Commissioners, good afternoon. Rick Azar for 771 West End Avenue. Uh, I'd like to thank Ms. Hughes and Ms. Bellinghausen for their assistance in bringing this to public hearing. Uh, yes, essentially the plan proposes a metal one over one window with a metal brick molding and interim stack detail that are close matched to the original details, all finished in an architectural bronze. The plan will maintain the single bipartite and tripartite grouping and the double hung operation of the original windows while retaining the uniform fenestration material and finish presented by the current installations of one over one of the little dark bronze windows, to which will be added a profile metal brick molding and metal interim stack detail that approximate the design detail of the original window. We submit uh, the proposed plan as appropriate, insofar as none of the original wood multi-paint windows remain. The windows that we see here at the far right of the bottom corner are metal uh, fire rated windows. Three of these have been replaced with one over one metal fire rated windows in the intervening years. Uh, we also note that the plan retains the grouping and the operation of the original windows. And the proposed one over one window installation ensures a uniform appearance for the building going forward. And the plan reintroduces 
now missing articulated three point in details that closely follow the original. Lastly, we respectfully note precedent for this program uh, in master plan approvals from landmarks within the last 18 months. Um, last year, 150 West 79th Street and 370 Riverside Drive, both designed by Schwartz and Gross. We also note, as uh, Ms. Hughes mentioned, that uh, details of this proposal have been approved previously by landmarks for apartment 12A at 771 West End Avenue. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah. Yes. Um, why are we going from a, what was clearly probably a sandstone or a limestone color to uh, bronze? Commissioner, there was concern over the appearance of the building over time. There were several applications which are pending, and the board of directors and the shareholders of the building didn't want to have a checkerboard appearance in the exterior of the building. So, because it's a massive plan, only those can be replaced over decades. Yeah. Yes. And then up with something that's actually appropriate at the end of that day. I understand that, sir, but the, the board felt that they didn't want, they wanted to have a uniform appearance to build. They didn't want to have different colors. And, and uh, you yeah, know, we've, we've actually approved it both ways. In, in some cases, we found it to be a real plus for the master plan proposed to turn it the original uh, profile of the next pitch. However, um, we have an opportunity to the configuration. And other times, we um, put a darker finish that pretty much this other finish because of this uh, change of time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions? Let's take testimony and see if we have more questions after that. Josette Amato. Good afternoon, Chair Carroll, commissioners. Josette Amato, Western Preservation Society. Master plans are so vital in historic districts. We would like to thank the applicants for taking this important step to safeguard the character of their homes for the future. This 1915 Schwartz and Gross building on West End still retains many wonderful architectural details. Unfortunately, over the past century, the original windows are not one of them. If the owners had chosen to restore the windows to original 9 over 1, we would be delighted. They were a wonderful part of the building. But as there are none remaining and the vast majority replaced prior to designation, we feel that requesting a return to the original historic windows would place an undue burden on the homeowners. According to the elevations, it appears the majority of windows are replacing like for like. In individual drawings for the windows, however, the frames are larger and some units have a narrower division between the windows. If this change harkens back to historic dimensions, we understand if not, it could be a striking visual difference between what exists now and what is proposed. So without historic context, we would ask that this change be minimal. Thank you for considering our comments. Thank you. Will Edwards? Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, Will Edwards for Landmark West. The Landmark West Certificate of Appropriateness Committee always appreciates when applicants place the forethought to prepare our windows master plan. It shows they are committed to their landmark and respect both the process and their resident owners enough to ease the process for all. While, this, while the proposal is an improvement over the existing block painting, we see the master plan as an opportunity to go all the way. This is the moment to return to the Schwartz and Gross intent and reinstate the multi-light over one windows throughout the stately edifice. This stately edifice. Anything less falls short of the potential presented in this one in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, the Landmark West Certificate of Appropriate Appropriateness Committee would support a modified master plan. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly Carroll. Kelly Carroll, Historic Districts Council. HTC finds the original configuration of the windows of 771 uh, that they should be maintained. Preserving the historic multi pane over one. Configuration would be more appropriate for the historic building. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this application? 
we have a, a resolution from Manhattan Community Board 7 uh, finding that given the absence of original windows and that the fact that the significant decoration of the primary facades, including particularly the details, Julia balconies, cornices, um, that the, the demonstrated that the loss of the original windows were not material, materially detract from the overall effect of the building and therefore recommended approval provided the critical, the panning, the uh, replicated building closely as possible. So, do you want to respond to any of the comments? Uh, no. Okay. Let's have a motion to close the hearing. I'm going to move second. All in favor? Okay. So, you know, again, this is another one where the commission has shifted its position over many decades and, you know, I think for a very long time where all of the historic windows were removed party designation and commission approved a lot of the configuration provided the panning and in some cases the color being replicated um, to ensure uniformity going forward. And in more recent years, we've taken a longer term view where we have asked for the master plan to actually go back to something more similar, if not matching the historic configuration. And even more recently, in the last year or so, we've started to look at the buildings on a case-by-case -case basis. And some of the factors that we've considered is whether the building is heavily ornamented and what style the building is, and it's a very middle <coughs> style. Deco, the steel or deco top facade, the window configuration, or importance to that style, or is it really exposed or ornamented? We found one of the ones to be appropriate um, in those cases because the building has other architectural elements that could um, support the style of the building. So that's sort of where we are now, is in this kind of case by case basis. Oh, right. 
And it's going to be that they will not. Um, I think it's just not a realistic thing to ask them to do. I really have to say. And I, um, you know, my building is going through this right now. But our founders are completely uniform, so, and to the original people, they are metal. Um, and I, I know just undertaking the cost of, of doing a whole building is astronomical for a co-op. So uh, I would have to say that despite the fact that I really do love this orig original configuration, I'm completely fine with one over one in the darker rocks. I agree with everybody. <laughs>
an application for a certificate of appropriateness and growth in Adam Block 1396 on 60. 132B 62nd Street, Northern East Side, Story District. Italian Style Roadhouse, and that's actually on 1871. The application is to legalize the installation of the area ways that can be installed without any significance. Commissioners, Amy Wooden, staff. This application is to legalize work done at 132 East 16 2nd Street, in which they installed a fence and gate, shown here. Uh, this shows our designation photo, so the fence that was removed uh, without permits is shown in this image here. Uh, the 40s tax photo shows the condition of the area where um, had already been changed with the stoop removed. So here's a close-up of the fence, which is 60 inches high. Uh, there's other aspects of the violation, including the installation of planters and a security camera that will be reviewed at stop level. Uh, so the only focus today is the fence and gate. Here is a photo of the neighboring building. Uh, this fence was approved by the commission under CMA 185455, which was issued May 4th, 2016. Uh, this is a fence that was legalized at a public hearing. Uh, it's also on the street street. Uh, so you know, I get slightly taller. Uh, across the street from the subject property is another tall fence. Uh, and then further streetscape photos showing a variety of conditions. Uh, build grow houses containing both stoops and basement entrances. Uh, here are the drawings um, showing the dimensions of the fence and gate that were installed. Uh, and I've just included this map so you can see the, the variety of the streetscape along the line, just because this one did not fully show up. Um, The applicant is here to answer any additional questions. Do you have any questions for the applicant? Yeah. Why is this installed without LPC approval? Hi, Connor Smith here on uh, behalf of ownership. Um, I was not with ownership uh, upon the installation of this gate, so it's not my knowledge as to why this was installed without approval. You haven't asked them that question. Uh, they have not given me a straightforward answer. <laughs> Fair enough. Any other questions? <laughs> All right, let's take a look. Just say I can't recall. <laughs> right, Kelly Carroll. Kelly Carroll, Mr. District Council. This fence and gate that have been installed without permits. Um, seem to be irregular and inconsistent with the historic character of the district. As there is no historic precedent for such design in the area, HTC has reason to believe that this proposal would not have been approved by the Commission had the applicant adhered to the proper application guidelines before completing the work. Commission Mayor? Commission Mayor, President of the Commission of Historic Districts. Friends Preservation Committee commends the applicant for having removed, having removed the security camera and planning to install without some LPC permits. However, Friends has long been an advocate for a more welcoming streetscape and cannot support the legalization of the five foot tall fence. Late 19th century townhouses such as 132 East 62nd Street were designed in such a way that the public sidewalk blended seamlessly with private carryaways. In the 1920s, when many of the original streets were removed, Small scale fences were usually installed, creating a sense of security while maintaining a harmonious streetscape. High fences, although present in the historic district, are not appropriate for the building style and create a hostile environment for the pedestrians. In addition, the existing fence sits at an odd, odd height, disrupting the pattern of the neighboring fences. Although friends typically takes issue with work done without a permit, in this case, we believe the style of the existing fence lacks historic features in a temporary manner creating a pleasant variation in the neighborhood. However, our position remains consistent when it comes to the fence height. We urge the applicant to consider a lower fence that is more in the scale of the row house and would still provide a sense of separation and security for the homeowners. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this application? Okay, we have 
uh, the resolution from the Committee Board of Eight, uh, recommending the application be disapproved. Disapproved. Uh, particularly exciting the modern design and six feet of the inch height. Yeah, please. Thank you. Um, the reasoning, Connor Smith again. Uh, the reasoning behind the uh, height of this fence, uh, we have received uh, several notices from neighbors as well as the city uh, due to uh, garbage overflowing our pails. Uh, pedestrians were uh, dumping trash off of the street into our pails, and there was a rodent issue. Um, as well, we had many instances where pedestrians were using our walk down as a public restroom. Um, so that obviously, is, you know, uh, imposes obvious issues. Uh, so that's why we, and I believe our neighbors as well, went with a higher uh, fence height. Thank you. <clears throat> so that the commission approved the fence to um, but slightly taller, and I do think it was for some of the same reasons at that time. Any final questions? Let's have a motion to close the hearing. Second. Second. All in favor? So, with that history of approving hot offenses on this particular block, these areaways are fairly narrow, and the sidewalk is very narrow as well. Uh, but certainly taller than historic fences were the last year, so. <coughs> okay, uh, thank you, no, no, no. Uh, standard I always use in these situations, I think, is that, uh, you know, would we approve this in the first instance? And my, my, answer, my answer for myself here is no. And the reason is not because the height, um, which um, we've approved previously, it is the design itself. Um, which is to say, um, it is it is more modern than it ought to be. Uh, it creates this incredibly busy um, um, appearance with the, uh, uh, the nature of the the, uh, the doors and windows behind it. Um, and uh, and then and that's the site. This is the only example of a fence site that doesn't have the that it doesn't that, it, that has a flat top bar, which is usually for a lower scale fence. Um, so so no, I wouldn't. I agree with everything you said, and that's what I would say. It's the design, it's not necessarily the height. Okay, at least not to give me, but <laughs> I agree. I, no, no, because, oh, you didn't speak. Oh, no, right. We're going in order. I'm no, so sorry. Just, okay, <laughs> so anyway, I agree, although I also, even though we approved um, the higher fence next door, I wouldn't approve it for height also. The, the, the garbage is already next to the window, which seems uh, should be somewhere else then. I'm just saying there are other ways to solve your your problems with the garbage. Um, and it doesn't have to be a high fence. So I would not approve it. Michael? The problem is that we you know we've kind of gotten hijacked into, into approving these high fences, you know, no one's had a gun for it or anything, but they're, they are all over the Upper East Side, and we've approved them time and again. I, I do think that it's, it, it's a mistake. I just don't know how to, and they're just so unfriendly, so what? Um, which I, I guess, so what is that it's not the historic condition of the streetscape. <laughs> And also, but, we don't approve them in other neighborhoods for this right. very reason. Right. Was the Upper West Side or, or and, the and village? And this is the <laughs> central part of this neighborhood. Right. I, I, I agree with you, but I think there's a problem in that we have so consistently approved in the past, in the recent past, without a particular reference to this issue. It's, it's tough for me to, to, say that, to say that, but I, I wish we could. I guess we can. But, you know. Yeah. It feels I weird. It feels weird. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about the design? I mean, I agree with you about the tickets on the top, and that would make it better, but uh, for me, it's not. Yeah, and I think, you know, in this district, um, on the blocks between 5th and Madison, where you had the 19th century houses that got 
entirely new Beaux-Arts facades. Those typically had taller fences. And I think that that has been um, a, sort of a finding, a reason we found it appropriate. It was a sort of trickle east uh, onto you know, buildings that are less grand and retain more of the 19th century facade. So I think that's sort of how that creep has started to happen here as opposed to other districts. I, I just reject the idea that <coughs> that A, t slightly taller fences are unfriendly, and that B, unfriendliness is a criteria. So I just, um, yeah. I mean, it, that there, these, particularly the houses that lost their stoops and retain their below, partially below grade entrance, they are very low on the streets. And in many of them in other districts have a much deeper area. There's something about the very short, narrow area with the very accessible front that I can understand as it is to have a taller fence. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just going in again. I, I in discussion of the land, and to the right of the ramble of this breakdown. I think uh, Sarah's point uh, about a taller fence should accompany a taller, grander building. Uh, a taller fence in front of a more ordinary Brooklyn style brownstone, even if it's on the upper uh, east side, um, probably in, is inappropriate. Maybe that's a way of getting more um, actual about this as opposed to uh, just that uh, instinct. Anyway, I guess we're not going to get through today. Okay, yeah. So I think, you know, there's kind of like, yes. Putting aside the fact that it, it, again, it angers me in a district where people know that this is something that needs LPC approval, I'm going to put that aside. Putting <coughs> aside the fact that um, it's unfair to rodents to have to climb up. <laughs> <laughs> the, the issue of the design and the height of problems. So, and, and maybe it doesn't have to be 42 inches, maybe they don't go the way in there, but I think that the, the 60 inches is too tall for most people. So, we should deny it as a legalization, and uh, we can work with any of them. I think that I have it against it. Thank you.